Keck appear for the people. Mr. Yana is appearing pro se with standby counsel Mr. Nelson. We had left off with the state's case and presentation of evidence yesterday. And so, Ms. Keck, for Mr. Jones, is the state ready to proceed today? Yes, Your Honor. We anticipate three witnesses today, and we anticipate resting after those three witnesses are called. All right. And Mr. Yana, defense ready to proceed today? Yes, sir. Okay. Your Honor, uh, yesterday the court, or I informed the court that I would go speak with Ms. Blackledge about her willingness to be interviewed by Mr. Yon. Uh, I brought Ms. Keck with me as well as Investigator Shoney uh, because I know that Mr. Yon expressed some concern about taking me at my word, so I brought a couple other people there. I spoke with Ms. Blackledge, asked her if she would be willing to speak with Mr. Yon. She indicated that she did not want to speak with him yesterday, but that we could talk with her today, and she may be willing to speak with him uh, today, but she wanted us to come back and talk to her about that. So uh, I'm passing that information along to the defendant here in open court so that he's aware of that. We did not arrange a meeting between them last night because that was the request of Ms. Blackledge. And again, if the court wants to acquire Ms. Keck, Ms. Keck was there as well, as well as investigator Shoney. Well, as an officer of the court, Mr. Jones, I will take you at your word and not inquire beyond that. All right, so we ready for the jurors? In reference to that, Your Honor, uh, I also in a sense received a message through our chirping system not myself but through another party that stated she was willing to but they told her not to well is mr shoney available let's see if mr shoney is available John Shoney? Yes, sir. All right, if you'd come forward. And I'm going to go ahead and have the clerk swear you in, Mr. Shoney. Sound testimony. You may give him the have a seat over here in the witness stand. Sergeant 
solely on the issue of Miss Blackledge wanting to either speak with the defendant, Mr. Yon, or not. Mr. Jones, do you care to inquire? Thank you. Investigator, for the record, your name is John Shoney, and you're an investigator with the, Quint with the uh, Adams County Sheriff's Office. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday, did I ask you to bring Karen Blackledge to the Sheriff's Office from the Adams County Jail? Yes. And did you do that? Yes. Uh, were you in the interview room with myself and Miss Keck when we inquired of Miss Blackledge about her uh, willingness to speak with Mr. Yon? Yes, sir. And when we spoke with her, at any point did Miss Keck or myself or you uh, try to uh, encourage her not to uh, speak with Mr. Yon? Uh, no, sir. When we spoke with Miss Blackledge, did she indicate that she did not want to meet with Mr. Yon? that day yesterday yes and did she indicate she may be willing to meet with him today but she wanted us to come back and talk with her today at some point to see if if she wanted to do that at that point yes sir and it was that the sum and substance of the conversation yes that's all the questions i have mr yon do you have any questions for mr shoney again solely upon this issue your honor i do not contest that fact um the uh witness or alleged co-defendant she's very unhonest and very iffy so i mean i i can't contest an officer's you words have no questions no sir all right you may step down thank you so the court is going to accept the testimony and evidence as presented through mr shoney of what actually occurred last night and reject defendant's statement which would not be evidence. Now, are we ready for the jurors? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Yon, you ready yes, for the jurors to be brought in? Yes, sir. All right. The bailiff would bring in the jurors, please. For the record, all members of the jury are now present. We left off with the state's presentation of their case, uh, concluding with the questioning of their ninth witness. Mr. Jones or Mrs. Keck, any further witness for the people? Yes, Your Honor, people would call Haley Carls Miller. All right, we can have the witness step into the courtroom, please.
you come forward to the clerk and raise your right hand, she'll swear you in. You sign me, sir, the testimony you may give, and the cause not pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Of you have a seat over here to my right in the witness stand, please. Pull up close to the microphone so it does amplify your voice. Thank you. And Mr. Jones, when you're ready with your questions. For the record, can you please tell me your name? My name is Hallie Carls Miller. And I'm going to have you pull that microphone a little bit closer to you, and we'll try one more time. Can you tell me your name? Hallie Carls Miller. Everybody here okay? Thanks. Miss uh, Ms. Carls Miller, what do you do for a living? I work as a forensic scientist at the Illinois State Police Springfield Crime Laboratory. Specifically, do you have a area of expertise, an area that you, your focus generally is? I do. And what is that? I specialize in firearms, tool marks, footwear, and tire track identification. In order to work for the Illinois State Police in that capacity, did you have to go through any specialized training or education? Yes, I did. And can you tell me briefly about that education and training that you completed? I received a bachelor's from Southern Illinois University Edwardsville in biology with a minor in forensics. And then I started with the Illinois State Police. They did an in-house training program that consisted of readings, lectures, tours of manufacturing facilities, and months of supervised casework. And after these months of supervised casework, is there a proficiency exam that you have to take and pass in order to be certified and to start your employment with the state police? Yes. And can you describe for us that proficiency exam? I get proficiency tested in each area I'm trained in. Um, it happens once a year, and I've passed all of those. And it, to pass those proficiency exams, is it true that you have to pass with 100% a proficiency. You can't miss any questions. You have to get them all right in order to pass. Correct. And you have to do that every year. Correct. And how long have you worked with the Illinois State Police? I started um, as assigned to the Springfield Laboratory in August of 2016. So in the last give math, seven, seven years, you've passed every proficiency exam 100% every time you've gotten every answer on those tests right. Yes, I have. Your Honor, at this point, we'd ask that Mr. and Ms. Carl's Millers be certified as an expert in the area of footwear impressions. Any objection, Mr. Young? No, sir. I will so certify this witness as an expert in the area of footwear impression without objection by defense. Ms. Carl's Miller, when we talk about footwear or shoe print impressions, can you tell us what we are talking about? Um, footwear impressions are impressions left at a potential crime scene when the shoe comes in contact with a surface. And when that shoe comes in contact with the surface, it leaves a mark? Yes, it may. Uh, it could be a 2D or 3D impression depending on the substrate that the shoe is stepped on. How do you use that impression that's left to make an identification? So what I would do is Either I receive a gel lift or an image or a cast, depending on the case, of the impression left at the scene or impressions. And I would make test impressions of the shoe or shoes that I received in the case and compare the test impressions to the evidence impressions I received from the case. Now, Ms. Carls Miller, every shoe that comes from the factory, if you have a Nike, every Nike shoe is gonna have the same sole, right? So how are you able to make a comparison? When the shoes are released from the manufacturing facility and before they are worn, they are all the same. The outsole pattern, depending on the make, model, and shoe and size, um, but there is no damage to the shoe. They are fresh and clean. But as the shoes are being worn by individual or individuals, the shoes can pick up damage, wear, as well as like rocks, glass, different um, like things that can be fit within the outsole that make the shoe um, individual in nature. So are you looking for those markings that make that outsole, that, that sole pattern that's left on the floor, or on the door at the crime scene, individualized? That's what you're looking for? Correct. I'm looking for the class characteristics, um, outsole pattern, shape, and design, as well as then looking further at the individual characteristics or the cuts, nicks that are within the impression. And in order to make an identification, you compare that print, if you will, to the shoe that you're given, 
and you look for those different uh, class characteristics, you look for those different uh, nicks, cuts, things like that, and you're able to make a determination to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Yes, based on my training and experience, I look class characteristics first, and if they agree, then I look further at those individual characteristics. And you say class characteristics, can you tell us what you mean by class characteristics? So that would, these attributes are determined prior to the manufacturing of this shoe. So for example, Nike might have an idea of what they're going to make, what the outsole will look like before they produce the shoe. And those attributes are used to group or exclude, include or exclude different impressions from each other. So let's say, for example, uh, you have a shoe print at the scene, and uh, you look at the shoe print at the scene, and it's a size 12 or, or something like that. Um, I wear size 16 shoes. If you're given a pair of my shoes, you would be able to say, we don't have to go any further. Those are clearly not the same size. Correct. If the outsole pattern, size, or design is different um, enough, then it is an elimination on class. And then you would go, if they do appear to be the same size, then you would look for the the tread pattern or another class characteristic to see if you should go any further. Correct. I would then look further if the class characteristics agree and then look for those little nicks, cuts, wear, damage on the outsole and see if it reproduces in the impression found at the scene. In this case, were you given uh, a pair of shoes at some point and also given some shoe prints from a crime scene? Yes, I was. Pull up shoes. On the screen, we have People's Exhibit 65 showing the defendant wearing a pair of white shoes. Were you, in fact, given a pair of white Reebok shoes, a size 12, for you to compare with some Jill listening to? Yes, I was. And I'm showing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 14. Does this appear to be a bag containing no shoes? Yes, it appears to be. And it says on the front, one sealed brown paper bag containing one... One set of shoes, white, size 12, Reebok men's shoes, worn by Yon at the time of his arrest. Does that sound like the shoes that you examined? Yes, I would look at the case number and item number. If I could have the bailiff approach the witness to it. Yes, these are the shoes I received in the Adams County Sheriff's case. The next slide, please. On the screen is People's Exhibit 66. And if you go to the next slide, People's Exhibit 67. Did these appear to be the outsoles <clears> or <throat> bottoms of those shoes that you observed? Yes, they're consistent with what I received. And you talk with us about class characteristics. First of all, you were talking about the size of the shoes, correct? Uh, Size is one of the class characteristics, as well as like the detail, how there's hexagonal shapes. As you, yep, yeah, as what he's pointing to in the arcs and the rebox, these are all class characteristics that if you were to put another shoe up that has like lug characteristics, they are different from what so I know. If you had a shoe print that had straight lines going up and down, not these hexagonal patterns or rebox and the other shapes, you could say they're not the same. They don't have the same class characteristics. Correct. They would have to line up with what I received in the case. And if the gel print does line up or the shoe print does line up, then you would want to go to the next step of looking for those individualized. Correct. Next slide. You were also given uh, some photographs, uh, DVD, uh, along with six footwear impressions recovered from the scene and again, as we said, one DVD with raw and uh, JPEG images. Is that correct? Yes, six gel lifts and a DVD. If I can have the bail approach with people's exhibit number four. <clears throat> yes, this is what I received. Up on the screen now, we have people's exhibit 38 showing three sets of footprints, is that correct? I didn't really look at these images because they were more crime scene photos and they don't have um, 
a ruler in them. So those were not necessarily my focus. I need a pic clear picture of a footwear impression like so, um, so I can then verify that what I'm seeing is one-to-one -one is in person. So when we talk, this photograph with the, uh, the slide or the, the scale on there, that was one that you were correct? It would be one I focus on, yes. And it would be people's exhibit 70. And again, you talked about class characteristics where we see the hexagonal patterns, the wave pattern at top, the uh, wave pattern at the bottom, and the word Reebok at the bottom, correct? Correct, those are class characteristics. And next slide, please. And we talked about gel prints. This would be a photograph of one of those gel prints you looked at, correct? Yes, a photograph of the gel lift, yep. And again, we talked about class characteristics, the hexagonal pattern, the wave pattern at the top, the wave pattern at the bottom, the word green bond, correct? Correct. And again, also class characteristics, the size. They appear to be the same size as the shoes in people's 14 that were taken from the defendant, correct? Yes, after I printed the images and made test impressions of the shoes, I have them, I basically have a light box that I will place them on top of each other to make my comparisons, and it was all consistent in shape and size. Mm -hmm. And people's exhibit 72, uh, gel lift, and tint marker 8, but for your lab report, I believe it was 5-5-1, is that correct? Correct. The gel lift I labeled 5-5, but the impression itself, there was one impression visible on this gel lift, and I labeled it 5-5-1. And again, we talked about class characteristics being the general size of the gel press that matched the size of the exhibit 14. Yes, consistent shape and size. And we talked about other class characteristics, the wave pattern, the hexagonal patterns in the midsole, the wave pattern at the end, the word Reebok at the heel of that shoe, correct? Correct. And those all match the shoes that the defendant was found wearing as well, correct? Yes, consistent in shape and size. Now, once you did that, at that point, did you look at Tent marker eight, your 5-5-1, that gel print, to go further for those specific uh, markers so that you can make a determination that they were, in fact, the same shoe. Correct. I used the printed images of the 5-5-1 and compared it to the right shoe impression, test impression I made at the laboratory. And when you compared that gel lift to People's Exhibit 14, what did you find? I determined that the um, impression in 5-5-1 was made by the shoe in item number 6 of DFS 21-40630. You made that determination to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, it's based on my training and experience as a forensic scientist. Training experience that you showed through your proficiency exams for the last seven years where you got everything right on every exam, correct? Correct. You also looked at the other gel prints and determined that they were consistent with being made by the same shoe, correct? I determined they have a consistent outsole size, shape, um, and patterns, but since I made an ID, in this case, to the pair of shoes, a uh, further examination was deferred, and that is a policy that we do at the Illinois State Police. Once you find one print that matches, one can assume that the other prints would also match, fair to say? Well, once the shoe is tied to the scene and an identification is made, then there is no further work that needs to be done. Thank you, ma'am. That's all the questions I have. Mr. Young, any questions? Yes. Uh, Ms. Miller, if I may, what are the standard size rulers y'all use in your profession? As I believe they're, they're black rulers but they do not show, they do, they do show an inch range. Um, I pulled up a, a picture here. Um, Judge, I have to object at this point. Is there a question? John, if you would ask the witness questions, please. Ms. Miller, you're positive that these were 12 inch size shoes rather than potentially 11 inches. Uh, I look at the size of the shoe based on the tag that is on both pairs, both shoes. And your determination was that they were size 12, correct? 
They were size 12 Reebok athletic shoes. And you used a ruler to measure them when you did your analyzations, correct? I did not use a ru ruler to measure them. I um, made test impressions using them and compared the test impressions to the impressions that were found um, on the gel lifts and the DVD. And uh, can you uh, give us a little bit of information concerning the rulers that y'all would use if you were to use one? Uh, the rulers are just, um, I do not necessarily use the rulers unless you take images, just so if you print the images and say you get the image from, we have a really nice printer with a uh, nice color, you would verify that the ruler in the picture is consistent with the ruler that you have in hand, that it's all consistent. It's a one-to-one -one ratio of the shoe image of the impression that you have compared to a test impression that you make at the laboratory. And uh, through your analyzations, you, uh, you, you analyze the shoe and you talked about class characteristics and marks such as rocks being stuck in the shoes or glass or cuts from just everyday usage, correct? There are wear um, and rocks, depending on the case, depending on the shoe, how it was worn, that do appear and cause damage to the shoe. And uh, if a person wore them shoes naturally every day, or I'll stick with the question at hand, if a person wore them shoes every day and they caused wear to be contributed to them shoes, and at a later time someone else wore them shoes, would you be able to tell the difference through analyzations of a scene picture or I don't understand the question I'm sorry okay so I've worn these shoes for three days here I've caused wear on them let's say which it hasn't been much but let's just say I've caused wear on them and then another person on the fourth day wears them and that person is say 50 pounds lighter than me or 100 pounds heavier than me and they go and commit a crime would you be able to tell through the char characteristics of the shoe and the gel lifts or pictures taken could weight or any other characteristic of a person wearing these shoes that was not the original person? Could you tell the differences in that? I guess I still don't truly understand that the impression I don't care who wears the shoes in the case. I just receive a pair of shoes and I compare them to an impression found at the scene. And based on the shoes that I received, the right shoe made an impression in the DFS 2140276. And that impression was through a gel lift, right? The DVD contained images of the impressions before they were gel lifted and then whoever lifted them then flipped the gel lift over and there were images, scaled images of the gel lift after. And the impressions, did, did you, you analyze them gel lifts? Do you mean like actually the gel lifts I received or the images of the gel lifts? Yes, the gel lifts. Mm -hmm. I, I did observe them, yes. And uh, this may help you out a bit better. Uh, the weight range, could you, throughout the, through, through observing the char characteristics of the actual shoe and then observing the gel lifts, is there, a, is there a way that you could tell the weight of a person who potentially wore them shoes at this time versus a person who normally wears them? No, I can't tell the difference from that. It's not possible. No, I can just look at the wear and damage that the shoes have when I receive them. So any person could have worn them shoes, correct? I have no idea who wore the shoes. But any any other person could have worn them, correct? I do not know who wore the shoes. It's a possibility. Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered. That's all I have, Your Honor. Any redirect? The shoes that you are given in People's Exhibit 14, 
left the gel print that you examined in People's Exhibit 4 that we saw on the screen, correct? Yes, an impression in 5-5-1 was made by the right shoe. Thank you, that's all I have. Any ring cross? No, sir. Thank you. Oh, Your Honor, we would ask that Ms. Uh, Carl's Miller be released from her subpoena. Mr. Yon, you have any intent to recall that witness? No, sir. All right. So, Ms. Carl's Miller is released from the witness subpoena and are free to go. State to have any further witness? Yes, sir. I would call Telly Masajewski. We have the next witness brought into the courtroom. If you would come forward to the circuit clerk, ma'am, and raise your right hand, she'll speak with you. All right, if you have a seat over to my right on the witness stand, please. You could scoot up to the microphone and pull it close to you. They are amplifying microphones. Mr. Jones, are you ready with your questions? Thank you, Your Honor. Can you tell us your name? Yes, my name is Kelly Masajewski. The last name is M-A-C-I-E-J-E-W-S-K-I. -E -E Sounds like you've been asked that. Yes. What do you do for a living, Ms. Masajewski? I'm employed at the Illinois State Police Forensic Science Laboratory in Springfield. Is there a particular area that you <coughs> specialize in focus? On? Yes, I specialize in the biology and DNA area section. In order to get that job, to have that position, was there some specialized training that you had to receive? Yes. Prior to my employment there, I got my degree in biology and English from Albion College in Albion, Michigan. And then I also got my uh, master's degree in forensic science from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And then uh, upon being hired by the state police, I underwent an approximately two-year training program that went through the methods and um, uh, techniques and things that are used specifically in forensic biology and DNA. After completing that two-year training process, was there a proficiency exam or an exam that you had to take in order to demonstrate the required knowledge and ability to receive full-time employment with the state police crime lab? Uh, well, throughout the two-year training program, there were uh, tests continually during that time that had to be passed and completed in order to move on to the next um, step in training. But then once the training was completed, I went through what is termed supervised casework, which is where you work cases um, under the direct supervision of another um, qualified analyst to ensure that you um, have mastered the techniques and things like that that are needed to work independently within the section. And once you receive that position, there's a yearly proficiency test that you have to pass as well. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We take um, actually two proficiency tests every year that are sent to us by an outside vendor and uh, where the results are obviously known to them but not to us. And then we have to complete those tests and um, issue the proper um, results to them in order to pass. And let's be clear, when we say pass, it's not a 70% and you pass. You have to get a, it's 100%. It's, it's, if you don't get any, everything right, you fail and you're not employed anymore. Yes, that's that's correct. Um, I don't know if it would end my employment, but um, I haven't had to deal with that. So, um, but yes, that you do have to have 100% on those tests. There is no there is no errors that are permitted. And for how long have you worked for the Illinois State Police? Um, since October of 2001. So, so for the last 22 years, you've passed every proficiency test, passed every exam that was required of you with 100%. Yes, correct. Your Honor, at this point, we would ask that Ms. Masajewski be certified as an expert in the area of DNA forensic biology. Any objection, Mr. Young? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right. The record will so reflect. We'll certify this witness as an expert in the area of DNA.
Let's start with DNA. Can you tell us in a general sense what DNA is? Yes, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it is essentially the building block of life. Um, you receive half of your DNA from your mother, half of your DNA from your father, and um, the majority of our DNA is the same. Um, however, there are some differences amongst the DNA, which is what makes us unique from one another. But the majority, like I said, is the same, which makes us human as compared to any other animal. Um, so we, um, in forensic DNA, we are looking at, of course, those areas that are different in order to identify samples as having come from a particular individual. Maybe this is a little simplistic, but there would be a DNA section that would relate to color of eyes, fair to say? Uh, yes, yes. And so somebody who had blue eyes would have one type of DNA in that section, and somebody who had brown eyes would have a different DNA at that section. I know it's very simplistic, but... Yes, yes, that would be correct. And you're looking, uh, when you analyze DNA, for these different areas of differences to determine uh, a DNA a profile, correct? Correct. We look at 23 different areas of DNA, and at each of those areas, um, you will have two DNA types, one type which was received from your mother, one type which was received from your father. So at each of those 23 locations, um, you have those two types which make up your profile at that one area. And we have 23 areas, so um, in combination, you're looking at a comparison of 46 um, different types that would need to pair up to be a match. And with the exception of identical twins, no two people have the same DNA profile. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's correct. With the exception of identical? With the exception of ident identical siblings, that's correct. In this case, uh, let me back up. In a general sense, then how do you do that DNA comparison in, in a general sense? Um, well, we have um, the DNA profile comes off of the instrumentation and it looks very similar to like um, if you've seen like an EKG graph or something like that. It has, it has peaks and those peaks correspond to DNA types. And so um, when I get that, I will then look at the DNA types that are present from an unknown sample or a sample where the source is unknown to me. And then I can compare that to the DNA profile from a standard, which would be collected from a known individual. And then I compare those types to see if they indeed match at each of those locations that I was able to generate results for from the unknown sample. You compare the unknown sample to the sample where you know where it comes from and you see if there's a correlation. Yes. That unknown sample comes to the lab usually in the form of a swab? Um, sometimes it can come in the form of a swab if it is something that was collected by the agency where they have swabbed an item or collected an item. Sometimes the actual item itself is sent to us. Um, just a general example would be like a soda can um, where I would then collect the swab from it myself. Um, it could be an item of clothing where I need to test for blood, so I will identify stains on, on the item and collect samples from that. So it can vary um, depending on what it is that we get. In this case, were there some swabs sent to you uh, from the crime scene and you were asked to do a DNA comparison? Uh, yes, I received um, swabs for some items and then I also received some um, some actual items where I collected the swab. Specifically, I want to talk first uh, about photograph 42. Um, in this case, there was uh, a 409 carpet cleaner can that was sent to the lab for both fingerprint and DNA testing. Yes, that's correct. DNA testing, that's, that's what you did. You weren't involved in the fingerprint testing, correct? Yes, correct. And that can was tested for DNA, is that right? Yes, I collected a swab from um, the top plastic nozzle portion where you would um, depress to um, to release the contents of the can. And you, uh, you took the steps that you took in order to create a DNA profile? Yes. Were you able to create a DNA profile? Um, yes, I was. Were you able to compare that DNA profile to a known standard? Yes. And based on that comparison, were you able to determine that unknown sample, the DNA from the can, who it came from? Yes. And who did that DNA come from on that can? 
I had a major DNA profile on that sample, and that major DNA profile matched that of Christine Lohman. Christina or Tina Lohman? Yes. I also want to talk about uh, some swabs that were sent to you. One, two, three. In People's Exhibit 81, were you given some, sw uh, some swabs from a uh, blood stain or red blood-like substance on the floor uh, in the, the kitchen area? Um, yes, I believe it was labeled kitchen slash living room. And did you take those same steps with regard to those swabs? Um, yes, I did. I first tested the sample for the presence of blood and blood was indicated. And then I completed the DNA process on that sample. You were able to get a DNA profile from that red blood-like substance? Yes. And you were able to compare it to a known standard? Yes, I was. And what was the results of your testing? There was a single source DNA profile from that sample, which matched that of Christina Lohman. Next, ma'am, I would like to talk about some swabs from a door handle of a safe. Specifically, what we have on the screen now is people's exhibit 50. Were you given some swabs uh, that were to have come from the door handle of that safe? Yes, I was. And were they tested for DNA as well? <laughs> yes. When you did that test, what were you able to determine? Um, on the sample that I was able to generate DNA results from, um, I had a mixture of two individuals on that sample. One, it was clear to me in comparing to the standards that one of the profiles came from that of Christina Lohman, and therefore I did what I call assuming her profile. And what that means is I look at her DNA types and I remove them from the unknown sample to see what is left over. Um, in order to generate what is known as a deduced profile. Um, the deduced profile being anything that is foreign to Christina Lohman. Um, and when I did that, I was able to compare that to the other standards that I had. And Timothy Schmidt was excluded from that. And Bradley Yohn was included as a contributor. And is there a, um, I don't want to say a number, but a degree to which you were able to determine uh, how Bradley Young was included in that profile? Yes. Um, when we have an inclusion um, like that, we use a statistical program um, that uh, indicates that that profile would be expected to be found in approximately one in 210 unrelated individuals. So out of 210 people, only one of them would be expected to have that same profile? Yes, um, that's approximate. So if you had a group of 210 people, it would be expected that of that group of 210, only one person would have those same DNA types that I was able to um, deduce out of that sample from the safe handle. In the course of your, with the lights. In the course of your analysis, were you also given a, uh, a depends uh, adult diaper to examine? Um, I did not actually receive the diaper myself. However, I did receive um, DNA that had been um, already taken through um, the process of the majority of the process of the DNA. Um, procedure, and um, I did testing on that sample. Now, can you describe for us the testing that you did on that sample? Yes, I did um, what is known as YSTR DNA testing on that sample. Is YSTR testing different than the process that we've previously talked about that was used in the other swabs? Uh, yes, it is. And can you describe for us those differences? Yes, um, when we are doing uh, DNA um, profiling, we are looking at all of the DNA generally. Um, so half from your mother, half from your father, as I explained um, previously, and that will generate a DNA profile. However, um, in situations where there is an abundance of female DNA present, um, and we can see that through a quantitation step that we do, which shows us how much DNA we were able to recover, um, we can see that there's a large amount of female DNA present and a very small amount of male DNA present. And when that happens, doing that standard testing that we perform 
the female DNA is going to overpower any of the other male DNA that may be present. And so we have something that we can use, which is called YSTR DNA testing. And that is DNA that focuses specifically on the Y chromosome, which only males have. Females have two X chromosomes, one X from the mother, one X from the father. Ma males have an X and a Y chromosome. So we can focus on DNA that is only present on the Y chromosome. And it allows us to essentially ignore all of the female DNA that's present in the sample and generate a YSTR DNA profile. Um, it's not as discriminating because a Y chromosome is carried and the DNA along with it is carried through a paternal line. So a father will have the same YSTR profile as any of his sons and the same as any brothers that that male may have. So it's not as discriminating, whereas all DNA is unique for individuals. It's not unique for YSTR profiles. It's unique, but not unique in the sense of the male paternal line. Correct. And in this case, that depends, was examined, and the female DNA was overwhelming, fair to say? Yes, that is correct. At that point, did our office, and specifically myself, contact the Illinois State Police Crime Lab and ask the crime lab to take this additional step of the YSDR test? Yes. And was that done? Yes, it was. In this case, after you did that YSDR testing, were you able to find some male DNA? Yes, I was. And were you able to compare that male DNA to a DNA profile, specifically the DNA profile of the defendant, Brad Leon? Yes. And when you did that, were you able to come up with a conclusion? Yes, I was. And what was that conclusion? Uh, Brad Leon was included as a male contributor in that sample. And again, much like the last uh, piece of evidence that you talked about, did the computer also generate a degree to which he was associated with that sample? Yes. And what was that degree? Uh, that profile would be, um, it's three, well, it's 310 times more likely that that profile came from Bradley Yohn or a paternal relative than from an unknown individual. The last thing I want to talk to you is the nature of DNA itself. Is DNA a, a hardy substance or is it something very delicate? Um, it, it can be hardy um, in terms of when it's on an item, if that item is preserved in a proper way, it can last for a very long time. So I could take a sample from the 1980s if it had been preserved correctly, and I could potentially get DNA from it. Um, however, it is it can be broken down or degraded. Um, there are certain things that if it's subjected to, it's going to break it apart and it's not going to be able to generate a DNA profile. So for example, if DNA is sprayed with carpet cleaner, that could very well degrade that DNA to the point where it could not be found. Um, I, yes, there are chemicals that would be present in carpet cleaner that would degrade or break down DNA. Thank you, ma'am. That's all the questions I have. Mr. Yon, any cross? Yes, most definitely. Give me one second, please. Uh, Ms. Masajewski, Masajewski, uh, you stated that essentially most every human being has some of the same DNA, correct? Um, yes, over 99% of DNA among humans is the same. Is the same, correct. So everybody here in the courtroom, we all have, in each of us, 99% of our DNA would be the same. Yes, that is, in fact, what makes us human as opposed to other animals. And Mr. Nelson or Mr. Downs here, officer and attorney, our DNAs would be the same, correct? Um, yes, at approximately 99% of your DNA. Okay, and um, I'd like to touch base just quickly on the few things that uh, Mr. Jones spoke to you about, and then I'd have some other questions for you. Um, you did say definition of DNA, it's a, the building block of life. Correct. It's what makes us. Yes. Um, areas that are different. 
Could you elaborate on them areas that are different? You said areas are loki locations. Yes. And um, you said you look at twenty three different locations when you do a test, correct? Yes, that is correct. And ultimately, you'll have. I believe it is 46 something. Could you relay that to us again? Yes. Um, we look at 23 areas and at each of those 23 areas, you will have two DNA types. So one from your mother, one from your father. So 23 areas times two, you'd have 46 locations for comparison. And, and let, let me pause real quick. I'd like to ask you what autosomal is. Yes, autosomal is um, what I refer to as our standard DNA testing. That's where we look at the areas of DNA where we have the one area, one type from your mother, one type from your father. That would be autosomal DNA testing, as opposed to YSTR testing, where we're just looking at that male chromosome DNA. And concerning autosomal and YSTR testing, one testing method could, I believe it is a YSTR, determines a specific person, correct? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. If you, I'll, I'll get back to that question in a moment. I have it down here in my notes. Uh, you said uh, that can, that 409 can, you tested the nozzle, you did a swab of that, correct? Yes, correct. And you did that swab yourself? Yes, I collected the swab myself. And you said that that uh, swab matched Christine Lohman, correct? Yes, I had um, at least two people present on that swab. Um, there was a major contributor and that matched Christina Lohman. Um, the minor or minor contributors um, were so low that, it, and potentially more than one person, that it was not suitable for comparisons. And. Uh, you, as you just stated, you had two assumed contributors. Um, I had two, the evidence of at least two contributors. Husband and wife living at home. That could potentially be both of them, correct? Um, yes, but because the minor profile was limited and potentially greater than one person, I could not make any comparisons. Thank you. Um, you did not receive any positives or not excluded for the defendant here on that can? Yes, on that can, that's correct. Um, and the stain on the floor, you spoke with Mr. Jones concerning that. You stated that it also matched Miss Christine Loman, correct? Yes, that is correct. And not the defendant myself? Correct. And uh, did you do multiple testing on that, or was it just one single test? One, just the standard DNA testing. And uh, just the standard DNA testing. When you analyze that, does it take time to analyze these things? Um, yes, the whole entire process from start to finish. Um, if you were only working um, an individual sample, it. It could potentially be done in about a day and a half, but um, usually I group um, samples together and the entire process from start to finish takes about three days. And with that group, there was, I believe, five to six people, if I may, uh, myself, the defendant, Bradley on Karen Blackledge, daughters, Ilsa Terrell, and Heidi Young and Mr. Timothy Schmidt, the husband, correct? Um, I did not have any standards from the daughters. Um, I don't recall the names you just said, but I did not have standards from them. Okay. And that obviously took some time to review these standards and test them. True. Um, yes. And you still did, it, as, in reference to that stain on the floor, you did not come up with any other DNA other than Christine Lohman's, correct? Correct. It was a single source profile. Uh, I want to touch base on the swabs of the safe. Um, you obviously didn't take them yourself because you were not at the scene and that is what is built into a wall. Um, you stated that that DNA was a mix of two profiles. Yes, that is correct. 
and you assumed Christine Lohman. Yes. That leaves us with one, correct? Yes, that is correct. And you come to the conclusion that Mr. Timothy Schmidt, who we have determined is the only one to ever touch that. Objection, Your Honor. Assumes facts not in evidence. Sustained. Your Honor, it was placed in evidence yesterday. Um, this was determined. It was asked through Miss Field. Um, Your Honor, sustain the objection. So I ask you next question. You excluded Mr. Timothy Smith. Yes, that is correct. And that was a complete exclusion. You did have nothing concerning him. Correct. And myself, Bradley S. Yon, was to be a contributor, correct? Um, included as a potential contributor, yes. A potential. And do you remember what Loki that was at? Um, may I consult my notes? Yes, you may. Most definitely. Thank you. Once I assumed out the victim's profile, Christina Lohman, from that sample from the safe, I had information remaining at four of the 23 locations that we test for. And at those four locations, um, I was able to then compare to the standards. And Timothy Schmidt was excluded at those locations and Bradley Yone included. Uh, it was, a, was it a definite positive or? Um, it has to be um, the exact same type at those four locations. And so yes, at those four locations, that type was shared at all four. I want to uh, speak on the depends. The depends, uh, you stated you did not receive it yourself. Correct. However, you tested other samples, other person's samples, correct? Um, yes, the, uh, the beginning portion of the DNA process was done by my colleague, Dexter McElhiney, and he completed that process through our standard DNA testing and generated a profile, but it was um, clear from our quantitation data that there was male DNA present, and that's when I then took the sample that he had, and then I completed YSTR testing on that sample. And you come with a not excluded for myself. Yes, that's correct. If you could, uh, do you have Mr. Miguel Heine's reports included in your file? Yes, I do. Could you review them qu quickly, please? Um, regarding the... Uh, regarding his test. His test, I believe it was number two. Or, excuse me, number three. On on that depends specifically? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of his results. And uh, that was to not include the defendant, correct? Um, through through that process, he had a single source female profile that was from that sample using the standard DNA testing that matched Christina Lohman. I have the report here myself. Uh, it says not or it says not. Excuse me, one moment. Not included, I believe. Or excluded. Excluded, yes. Right, um, excluded. Yes. And that, that was the first initial test, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, could you point out to the jury and the people here the amount of contributors on his test to the inner and the outer swabs? Um, the number of contributors, is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, he had a, um, on the inner swab, which is the one that I then completed YSTR testing um, after his test, he had a single source female profile that matched that of Christina Lohman. Um, on the outer swab, um, let me consult my notes and see what that says.
for that, it also was one contributor mashing that of Christina Loman. And that was on both samples. That was the outer waistband, I believe it was, of the Depends and the inner pad. Yes, that is correct. Um, I'd like to step over to your report, and that's number four. Uh, that is the testing you did on the Depends. Okay. And that was also the outer and inner, the same as Mr. Tim, or excuse me, Mr. Miguel Heine did. Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. And can you tell the contributors on them two samples? Yes. The swab from the inner portion of that um, depends was a mixture of two males. And one of the males, in comparison to the standards that I had, appeared to be that of Timothy Schmidt, who I received as an elimination standard. So um, similar to how I did with um, the swab from the safe, I was able to remove his DNA types from that sample to see what was left over. And what was left over from that, I was able to then compare to the other standard I had from Brad Leone and see that he was included as a contributor or as a potential contributor to that sample, which means it matched at all of the areas I was able to compare. Um. And would you look at item 1H2 swab of outer waistband in front of disposable depends blood? Yes. And the number of contributors there? Yes. That was a mixture of at least five males from that outer portion of the depends, and that was not suitable for comparisons to standards due to the number of contributors. And you stated them, them five contributors were males, correct? Yes, because it's a male-specific test, I know that there are um, that they are all male, and um, there is evidence of at least five contributors. Five contributors. Correct. Um, I like to since you're here on this test already. I'd like to uh, touch base on 1D1 sample from fingernail swabs. Okay. Uh, the right hand, that yes. would be. And you, could you read that box off for us, please? The number of contributors on down. Um, yes, I did YSTR testing on those fingernails as well because there was an indication that there was male DNA present. And I have a single male contributor on that which matched that of Timothy Schmidt. And excluded Bradley and on. Correct. And Mr. McGill Heine, his testing did the same, correct? Um, I may I consult my notes on yes, his report? Yes, on his, um, on Dexter McElhiney's report where he did the testing on those fingernails, he had a single female contributor using the standard DNA testing, which matched Christina Lohman. So um, essentially the female DNA was in such high concentration, it was overpowering the male DNA. And so that is why that sample then moved to YSTR testing. And it moved to YSTR testing and it only come to the conclusion of Mr. Smith, correct? Correct. I'd like to step down to, I apologize for jumping around. I'm not the best as, uh, as you can tell. Um, I'd like to step down to 2A of your report, number four. It is swab from outside right sleeve of navy blouse, navy blue blouse, I apologize. Okay. And can you tell us, shed some light on that test there. Yes, um, I did YSTR testing on that sample, and I got no YSTR profile. Okay, and 2B, it's swabbed from the outside left sleeve of navy blue blouse. Yes. And could you tell us the number of contributors and that give us, shed some light on that information for us? 
Yes, again, I did YSTR testing on that sample, and that had at least one contributor present. Um, it was very in, in very low concentration and potentially more than one person, and that was not suitable for comparisons. You stated potentially more than one person. Yes. So it's not for sure. You, you, here on the test, it says number of contributors, at least one, but it's potential for more. Yes, um, there is clear evidence, and I shouldn't say um, at least one person, it's at least one male because it was YSTR testing. Um, and so there was clear evidence that there was potentially more than one person present, which is why that sample then becomes unsuitable for comparison. Yes. And uh, after relaying these, this information here on test four, that would infer that testing is not absolute, correct? No, testing is absolute. It is? Yes. Okay. Um, the testing methods, uh, could you explain to the jury, the people here today, why test the procedure in testing as far as swabbing, the cuttings, dividing them up amongst scientists, the reasons for these things? Um, yes, YSTR testing is not used, um, it's not used consistently on every single case and therefore not every analyst is trained in YSTR testing. So in this situation specifically, um, Dexter McElhiney is not trained in YSTR testing. Um, it's used, you know, like I said, in, a limit, in limited situations on cases. And so when analysts have a sample that is potentially suitable for YSTRs or needs to have YSTR testing conducted on it, then it will be sent to a YSTR analyst, um, in which I am. So that's um, why that was divided up in that way. But we also have um, a large number of cases that come into our lab. Not one individual can work every single case. Um, and so the work gets divided up amongst us, but then sometimes certain things are needed on cases or um, things just need to be transferred to another analyst for a variety of reasons. Uh, in reference to that, uh, is it possible that tests are also divided up amongst scientists in order to get a, a positive insight on such tests, a positive outlook on them. No, I wouldn't say that would be correct. It's really just a matter of how evidence flows through our system. We all undergo the exact same training, um, with the exception of, you know, some people are trained in certain tests that others are not. But we all can um, have the same qualifications and things like that in terms of conducting DNA testing. We are all trained in autosomal DNA testing. Um, it's just that sometimes samples need certain things. We also have analysts that are trained only in bone. Again, we don't do DNA on bone very often, so we only have a few DNA analysts trained in that. So it's just a matter of how things flow and work in the laboratory. Give me one moment, if you will. Uh, that safe handle. That safe handle. Um, based on your professional, your professionalism, your standing in your scientific community of DNA. Um, If I were to touch this cup every day for a week and I drank from it several times a day um, and then it was later tested and it was touched by another being before it was tested, approximately right before it was tested, what's the chances that myself, the person who has touched this cup every day, their DNA not be on that? What are the chances that their DNA not be there? They'd be excluded. Um, I can't really give you a quantitative answer on that. Um, it will depend on what may have happened to that cup in between when it was handled multiple times by you and then 
before it was handled by the other person. Um, but I, I can't speculate as to what the chances would be. I mean, I, if you were to ask me, I would expect to find your profile, but at the same time, I don't know how that cup was handled in the meantime between my testing and you touching it and drinking from it. Is it, well, let me use the, the safe for an example. If it was built into the wall and it was not ever washed or regularly washed or sprayed down, then you would still expect my DNA to be there if I was the one to touch that regularly at all times, correct? Um, I would expect it in general if you handled it many times um, without use of gloves and things like that. And without washing? Correct. Okay, Miss uh, Massachusetts. Uh, if you would give me one second. Um, is it true that autosomal testing, it does point to specific individuals, correct? Um, yes, it certainly can. If you have information at all 23 locations, then it's a very, it can be a very strong association. As you um, have less and less information, if you're able to obtain less, um, for example, if you only look at one of those 23 locations, it's not nearly as discriminatory. Um, it'd be similar to if you were going to describe someone in this courtroom and you start with brown hair. Well, that eliminates some people, but not all. But then you add, okay, brown eyes. Well, then you eliminate a few more people. And then if you say, you know, wearing a blue shirt, you eliminate more people. So the more um, locations you're able to add to a DNA profile, the more discriminating it becomes. So a full 23 location profile, it's a very strong association to an individual. But again, as you lessen the amount on that, it can get a little less discriminatory. And uh, would you give us some insight on what touch DNA is? Yes, touch DNA is um, just simply um, a matter of trying to find out who may have handled or touched an item. Every time you touch anything, um, if you have a pen that you use, you leave behind some DNA. You walk up to a counter, you rest your hands on it, you leave behind some DNA. Um, the more it's handled or um, the more vigorously it's handled, um, then you'll get more DNA to have been deposited. But essentially that is what touch DNA is, is just trying to determine who may have handled or touched an item. Perspiration, skin particles, hair, um, there would be issues in touch DNA, correct? Um, hair would not. Hair is different, but um, like I said, touch DNA is really just the sloughing off of skin cells and trying to determine um, who handled or touched that item. Would you uh, relate to us the variety of techniques you use in your profession concerning touch DNA? Um, I'm not Judge, sure. I'm going to object. I'm not sure that's relevant at this point. There's been no evidence of touch DNA. Um, let, me, let me rephrase this. Let me let me ask another question. All right. So we'll sustain the objection if you can ask it or rephrase the question. The depends. Bloody. Um, you come to the conclusion to not exclude the defendant, correct? Yes, that's correct. And that wasn't a sperm DNA finding, was it? I, no, I don't believe so. I believe that was just a swab that was collected from the inside of the Depends. Could you review your notes possibly to make sure or? Um, I, yes, I can see if I have that report. I didn't actually have the Depends. I only received the DNA um, in the tube that was already um, processed, so. To, to make it simpler on you, uh, could you determine whether it was touch DNA or sperm or? Um, no, like I said, I don't believe there was um, sperm semen testing done. Um, it would have underwent a different technique in the DNA process if there was sperm present. Um, so I believe that was just a swab for the purpose of seeing if there was touch DNA present. Uh, 
uh, uh, would you uh, explain to us what PowerPlex, Profiler, Cofiler, Minifiler, and Identifiler are? Judge, I'm going to object. It's a compound question. He's asked to explain four different things. Um, if you could rephrase the question. Could you explain to us what Identifiler is? Yes, Identifiler is a previous DNA typing kit that we used to use. Um, we now use PowerPlex 23, which tests 23 locations. Identifiler is our previous kit that we used prior to that, which tested 15 locations. So the mo most common test used today is PowerPlex 23? Yes, that is correct. And uh, I have a, an important question here for you. Um, resubmitted. When one resubmits an item, what does that mean? It just means that the agency has previously brought an item to us that we either looked at or we deferred at that time, and it was sent back to the agency, and then resubmitted is just them bringing that same item of evidence back to us. And uh, were there any items you submitted in this case? Not that I'm aware of. Give me one moment and I'll pull up some information. <laughs> I have items one, two, three, four, and five that were resubmitted by the investigating agency of Adams County on 12 6 of 21. And then I have 10, 12, 13, 17, 28, and 29 resubmitted. That would mean that these items were brought back to you on. If that's the um, information you have, I do not have that information with me. That's case, excuse me, case jacket DFS 21-040276. And it is page two of 040276. Ms. Mason, uh, you, you're, you're positive you do not have that information with me? Because if I step down to sub number five, and this was received 330 of 2022, it states, the Adams County Sheriff's Office. Judge, I'm going to have to object at this point. If he wants to show her the report, that's fine. But he needs to have a copy of the report to show her to the show it to the witness or admit it into evidence or something like that. Him reading whatever he's looking at his computer screen is not appropriate. Your Honor, uh, but if I could first, I've got to determine I'm sustaining the objection. But if this witness generated that report then she would be able to review her notes or her reports to find that if you can direct her attention to that otherwise you'll need to provide her with the document you're referencing so that she'll be able to review it and know if she knows anything about it so you could pull that out and your honor if i may could we take a very very brief recess if i could get this document printed off it would only be approximately four pages i believe and it, it has a very, very valid reference to item number eight, which is the safe swab handle or the safe handle swab. We're going to take a brief recess. We've been at it for a while now, and so we'll excuse the jury to the jury assembly room for that brief recess. Please jump, please rise.
Seated. Ten thirty. If Mr. Nelson or the state can help uh, Mr. Yon get a printed copy of that document, I will. Then. I apologize, Your Honor. I, I was never given these these documents in paper form. It's actually never given a lot of documents. Yes, sir. <laughs> It's uh, it's it would be the uh, four hundred six. It's the only one on there. Four hundred six, right there. It's going to be forty five. Yes.
Because you're not the judge. Right. There was an error in this one. You just updated a copy of that instruction.
Did you get the report you needed? Yes, I did, Your Honor. All right. Are you ready to proceed then? Yes. All right. The bailiff could bring the jury back in, please. For the record, that all jurors have returned to the courtroom. We took a brief recess for morning break and the defendant to obtain a printed copy of a report he was referencing. Mr. Yawn, are you ready to continue with your cross examination? Yes, sir. All right, you do so. Um, sorry, man, Miss Messages. Uh, we spoke on uh, resubmitted items. Yes, and, and can you state one more time for the record what resubmitted means? Yes, resubmitted is just when um, an item has been to the library previously and it is then sent back to the agency and then it is resubmitted or resent back to our laboratory at a later time. And uh, I was speaking in numbers of items that were submitted 
and then resubmit it to your agency. Okay. Um, the specific item I want to speak on, and Your Honor, could I uh, ask the bill to give Ms. Masajewski a copy of the reports? Sure. Ms. Masajewski, they're uh, in order of the case file I received here that I have on a computer. Um, if you would look at page number one. Okay. It has sub numbers under submission info. And this is the case we've been talking about, 040276. Um, submission numbers one two, three, four, and on page two is submission number five. Um, could you explain number two, number one and two submissions? Would them be the original submissions? Yes, they appear to be. And then you come down to three and you have what is resubmitted on 12 6 of 21 and could you read off the numbers of items resubmitted yes it states items one two three four and five and then if you proceed on to number four you have a resubmitted data of 12 13 21 and you have items 10 12 13, 17, 28, and 29, correct? Number four, sub, sub number four. Um, yes, that's what it um, appears that 10, 12, 13, and 17, it states resubmitted. <clears throat> and the at risk beside it means that they were resubmitted, correct? Um, that's what it appears to mean, yes. And then if you'll please go to the next page, number two, you have sub number five. And these both have the at risk beside the numbers. These are numbers, excuse me, this is received date of resubmission of 330 of 2022, correct? Um, that's what it appears to be, yes, 330 of 22. And could you, <coughs> relate to the people in the courts and the jurors what them items and item numbers are. Uh, items eight and nine. And uh, in reference, I apologize, I'd like to bounce back to your report, I believe at number 12. Um, could you relay what item number eight is? Um, yes, item number eight are the swabs from the uh, safe. The safe. Mm -hmm. So they've been resubmitted at a later date. Well, um, I, I need to explain um, this, this paperwork a little further. Um, if you look at the original submission dates, which is um, submission number one on page one, um, that is talking about it being received at crime scene region three. If you look over to the far right on the page, it says crime scene region three. That is not our laboratory, but it is an ISP facility. Um, and so um, it appears that when it is then marking things as resubmitted, that it's actually using all of the data which is in the system, which would include the crime scene. Um, my understanding and looking at this and seeing who those items were received by and looking at um, the paperwork in totality is that um, it was not received at our laboratory twice. It was received at our laboratory um, just one time. Okay. Uh, if you would uh, go to page seven of seven, and that is under lab case continued completed reports. I'd probably make it simpler on you to just ask what section TR is. What section TR is? Yes, um, what the TR would represent. That is um, trace chemistry. And what what is trace chemistry? 
um, trace chemistry uh, is um, hairs, fibers, gunshot residue. And what do they do at trace chemistry? Um, we don't have trace chemistry at our laboratory. Um, we have a trace chemistry section in the Chicago laboratory, um, but um, they, they examine uh, hairs to see similarities if they could have been um, originated from a common individual, um, fibers, what type of fiber it might be, or um, I, I'm not trained in this, so I, I don't really want to speak too, too much further on it, but um, they look at fibers and commonality of fibers, and then they look at gunshot residue. Okay. Um. Uh, Your Honor, that's all I have. Would be, I would reserve the right to call her at a later date if possible. Judge, if he has more questions for this witness, she's a crime lab person. He needs to ask those questions now. Well, he'll be allowed to present his case at his time when the burden, or I'm sorry, the burden never shifts, but when the case and presentation of any evidence he wishes to present switches over to him. Right now we're on the state's direct, and so I am... Do you have any redirect, Mr. Jones? Your Honor, I have no more questions for this witness. I'd ask that she be released from her subpoena. All right. And Mr. Yon, is this witness going to be allowed to go back to the lab and back to her regular duties, or are you going to be recalling her? Give me one moment, Your Honor, just approximately 45 seconds. I, I do have a specific question for you, Ms. Masajewski. Uh, the swab on the floor, was it tested for any other substance, such as maybe a chemical? Uh, no, I only tested that for blood. So you were not able to tell whether there was a chemical? I do not test for chemicals. That would be a, a chemistry section. All right. In this type of case, uh, whereas the claim was to be sprayed or penetrated, whichever it was, with a can of this nature, wouldn't it be logical to test for such? I, I don't make the requests as to what samples get tested. Um, and quite honestly, I don't even know if that would be possible with that type of sample, but that would um, had that would have been something that we don't decide at the crime lab. We are. Um, we are kind of somewhat instructed as to what we are looking for and what we what we should be testing for. <clears throat> and uh, there, there's a such thing as a case correspondence history, correct? Yes. Where you correspond with the agency, such as Mr. Jones here or the detectives in the case. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> are you, do you have that case correspondence with you? No, I don't. Um, I don't have that as part of my case notes. Um, you had several conversations with uh, Miss Kelsey Miller, correct? Um, if it indicates that, I, I believe I did, but I, like I said, I don't have that paperwork in front of me. Um, so I may need to see it to recall the conversation. Your Honor, could I briefly have the deputy take this laptop and show her? Yes, the bailiff to carry it up there for you. It's already pulled up. Save a lot of time rather than option. And that's a case correspondence on 040726, correct? Yes, that is correct. And uh, in that paragraph, you'll see towards the right and middle, um, it states that victim, I believe it's the word victim, was penetrated with a can or cleaning bottle. It may some, some it may not be verbatim, but it says something to that effect, correct? Can you give me a moment to read it? Yes. Oh, thank you.
Okay, I've had a chance to review it. What was your question? And, and the, does it say anything about penetration by a cleaning bottle? Um, yes, it states that um, I, this is a conversation with uh, Kelsey Miller, and um, it indicates that she informed me a cleaning bottle was used to penetrate the victim and was sprayed into her mouth and on her body. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'll take that back, please. We'll have to return the laptop to the defendant. And just for the record, that's not a positive conclusion. That's not something you analyze, correct? Yes, that's correct. That was just um, getting some information on the case so that I had a direction to know what to do with um, the evidence that was submitted and what I, um, what I needed to or possibly where I should collect evidence from. Thank you, Ms. Massachusetts. I rest. All right, so Mr. Young, can this witness be released from her witness subpoena with your further questioning? I take that back. I apologize. I do apologize. I will, since you're here, and I, I want to go ahead and get you out of here, uh, I want to touch base on the knife. Okay. Uh, you obviously tested that, correct? Um, yes, I did. And we spoke on touch DNA, mm -hmm. such as me grabbing this napkin here and it's logical to say that my touch DNA is there, correct? Right? Um, yes, every time um, you touch an item, you do leave behind some DNA. Uh, it's just a matter of whether it is enough DNA for us to be able to detect. We do have thresholds that need to be met when it comes to DNA. Um, in previous examples, um, I've spoke of at least one contributor where there's evidence below our threshold that there may be someone else there, but we do have thresholds in place. So um, just because you touch an item doesn't mean I will always be able to detect that DNA on that item. Okay, and do you have that report with you or do you remember it? Regarding the knife? Yes. Yes, I have it. And uh, that report, could you tell us the contributors on that report? Yes. <clears throat> the swab that I received from the knife um, had a mixture of two people on it. There was a major contributor, which matched that of Christina Lohman. And then there was a low-level second contributor um, at one of the 23 locations that we test for, from which Timothy Schmidt um, cannot be excluded from. So he's included as a potential contributor of that limited second DNA profile. And you, uh, the main standards you tested were the defendant and a, a code of freedom, right? Correct. And, uh, I, I, I shouldn't say main. I mean, I tested a standard from, uh, um, yes. And out of them two people, uh, there was no DNA on that knife from them two. Um, that, that I could detect, correct. correct. And uh, these, I believe you tested the fabric from the chair? Yes, I did test fabric from a chair. And would that be the same results? Um, for the fabric from the chair, I did semen testing on that. I was looking for the presence of semen, and semen was not indicated on that sample. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Masajewski, uh, no test is perfect, correct? I, I, you I'll, have to be more specific. I'll reword this. ISP Forensics Labs has issues just as other issues, as other labs do, correct? Objection, speculation, I'll overrule the objection. I rest, Your Honor, this witness can be released. I'm overruling the objection, you can have her answer if you like, Mr. Young. No. Okay, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, um, not every test can be for sure. True. Um, we, have, we have tests that are indicative tests. Um, that means a sample is, or like blood is indicated. It 
can possibly test or react with other things. So um, I, I don't know if you would say that's an imperfect test. It's just not a conclusive test. Um, it gives an indication of a substance. Um, with semen, we have indicative tests with semen, but then we also have a microscopic test where if I view sperm, that is a conclusive test. I have visually seen the sperm and therefore I know semen is present. So when we're speaking in scientific terms, there's indication of substances. There's also conclusive results. Um, as with DNA, DNA is what it is. The results I get are trustworthy and I would say that they are perfect. What I see is actually what is there. Um, so I, in terms of um, your specific question, I'm not sure if I've answered that, but um, if you have anything further, go ahead. Not yourself, but there are faults in analysts' testing. I mean, there, there are complications at times. There are testings that one may mess up on uh, situations in the lab where something may spill or an additive of solution is added and it is too much by accident. And it... um, if there are things that are done in the laboratory that affect results, we do have quality measures to deal with those and those get um, indicated within the file. Um, we do have what are called incident reports that if there is something that were to happen in a case, it gets documented. Um, you know, essentially everything we do is an open book and all of our reports and things are reviewed by another qualified analyst when we are done. Um, and again, if there was some sort of incident in a case, it gets reported within the case file and that becomes part of the documentation of the case. Um. There, there is what there's called independent testing labs. For yes, that's correct. And sometimes there's testing that has been done at ISP that is has faults or issues that people perceive to have independent testing going on. Right? Objection assumes facts, not in evidence. All right, you are. Thank you, Ms. Masajewski. I appreciate you coming today. All right, Mr. Yon, may this witness be released from her witness subpoena? Yes, sir. All right, so we are free to go with our thanks, Mr. Jones, unless you have any read your no. All right, so you are free to go. Thank you. If you could return to the bailiff, the items that we passed up, you need to look out. You can return those. Thank you. Jones, next witness for the state. People call Brian Long. Brian Long. Forward, sir, to the circuit clerk up here and raise your right hand. She'll swear you in. I do. Have a seat over here to my right in the witness stand. Jones, when you're ready with your questions. Thank you, Ryan. Can you tell us your name, please? Brian Long. What do you do for a living, Mr. Long? I am a forensic scientist uh, with the Illinois State Police at the Springfield Forensic Science Laboratory. Is there a specific area that you specialize in? Yes, I specialize in the examination of latent prints. When we uh, talk about latent prints, are we talking about fingerprints in the vernacular? Yes. In order to receive that position to do that job, was there specialized training that you had to undergo? Yes, there was. Could you describe that for us? It was a two-year formal training program that uh, went over the history of fingerprints, uh, how fingerprints are developed uh, in the womb, um, goes over how to process for fingerprints, comparing fingerprints, um, 
and then uh, we've got other things such as courtroom demeanor training and um, that was mostly it. Uh, After you completed that, well, during that two year training program, were there proficiency exams that you had to pass? Yes, sir. Did you pass all those? Yes, I have. And after you completed your training, was there also yearly or twice a year proficiency exams that you have to undergo uh, to retain your position in the state ones in the Illinois State Police? Yes, there's a annual uh, proficiency, proficiency uh, exam that I have to take. And have you passed every one of those proficiency exams? Yes, I have. Your Honor, we'd ask that this witness be certified in the area of late friend specific. Any objection, Mr. Young? No, sir. All right. The court will find this witness to be certified as an expert in latent prints. Mr. Long, can you tell me what the fingerprint is? Uh, a fingerprint is uh, an impression that's left behind on something that comes from the usually the distal end of someone's fingers. So, I guess when you say latent print, latent print is what's left by the fingerprints that are on your hands. Is that fair to say? Yes, if uh, you go to touch, if you touch something, uh, it's possible that you're leaving behind some kind of residue, uh, which I would call a latent print, yes. And everyone's fingerprints are different. That's correct. If you were given a latent print from a scene and a print from a suspect, are you able to look at those prints and determine if they're made by the Sometimes, but not all of the time, yes. When you're making that process, or when you're doing that process, tell me how you make that determination if it's made by the same person. I do a side-by-side -side comparison of the latent print to uh, someone's known prints, and I'm looking for the agreement in size, shape, uh, spatial relationship of individual characteristics in both prints in order to make an identification. In this case, were you first given an item and asked to determine if there was if there were any latent prints on a particular item? Yes. And was that a 409 carpet? Yes, that was one item. And I'm handing this to you have a bailiff handy with one of these people to free. Was that the can that you were asked to determine if there were any latent prints on that can? Yes, it is. Can you tell me that process, how, how you look for latent prints on a physical item? Uh, this particular item, it was a spray can. Um, I, I took it out of the packaging and first did a visual examination to see if there were any prints that I could see prior to me doing any processing on it. Um, after that, I uh, attempted some processing techniques to try to d develop latent prints on the item, um, such as uh, superglue fuming, where fumes from superglue will adhere to any residue that's left behind on the item, making the prints more visible. Um, after that, I applied powder uh, using a brush or uh, dusting for prints. Um, and after that process, I applied uh, two different dye stains and examined the spray can using both laser light and ultraviolet light, looking for the presence of latent prints. When you did that process, were you able to find latent prints or alien? Yes, I was able to find one uh, suitable latent print on People's Exhibit 3. Once you find that latent print, what's your next step in determining that comparison? Uh, I then, uh, once I've found the latent print, I then compare it to any uh, known prints that are given to me. And in this case, was there a known print from the defendant Bradley? Yes, there was. Did you compare the latent print? Your Honor, I object. I never um, received, Your Honor, I never received these reports. I do not have them in my possession. In approximately a little bit over a year and a half, I've still never received them. Well, at this point, We'll ask the jury to step out. If they would accompany the bail to the jury. So we'll address the jury. They jump to the drive.
Your objection it began. You had not received these reports, so. No, Your Honor, I do not have these reports. Uh, I do not have them in digital either. All right, Mr. Jones, care to respond? Judge, it's discovery number 13. It was provided to him at the date staff 0484. If that's copy, show that it's been bank stamped. That shows that it was discovered to him. I would also point out to the court that the defendant asked for at one point an expert in money to hire his own expert in fingerprints. So for him to suggest he doesn't have to report would seem to belittle his previous request that he wanted his own fingerprint expert to specifically confront information from Ryan Paul. I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, I have a report as far as a laboratory report finding. I do not have any digital information. I do not have pictures of the print. I do not have any analyzations. All I have is just the report, Your Honor. You have the report. The report is not a full disclosure of discovery concerning this item. Uh, the report is simply the findings. Uh, I'm sure I should be entitled to the rest as, well, I've gotten everything else. I believe, except for report 12 in digital. That was the uh, copies I had Mr. Nelson make earlier. They were digital copies. Um, a simple report just tells that there was a finding, Your Honor. It don't give you any detail. Does that report disclose what the finding was, Mr. Yon? Yes. All right. So your objection is overruled. The items in the state's possession have been provided to you, being the report and conclusion therein. Are we ready to have the jury to return to further? Mr. Yon, are we ready to have the jury brought back in? Uh, I guess not. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Bailiff, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
record, the jurors have all returned to the jury box. The defendant's objection has been overruled. And so, Mr. Jones, if you would repeat the question. Or I can make sure I'm back. I'm not really sure where we, where we were. Um, I think where we left off was that you had found a latent print on that 409, that carpet cleaner can. Um, and I had asked you if you had a comparison print from Bradley on to compare the latent print. That's correct. And you did have a comparison print from the defendant to compare the latent print. Is that right? Yes, I did. When you compared the latent print that was found on that 409 can to the known standard, the print from the defendant, Bradley on, what did you find? I found that the latent print uh, on the spray can in People's Exhibit 3 was made by the person whose fingerprints appear on the card marked Bradley S. Yawn. In your role with the Illinois State Police, we've talked about how in the first piece of evidence you looked for the latent prints yourself. Are there also occasions where latent prints are recovered by an agency and they are sent to you for conversion? Yes. In this case, did that happen as well? Yes, it did. Specifically, were there latent prints sent to you in digital format as well as uh, friction ridge loops from the Illinois State Police from a Toyota Avalon found in Springfield? Yes. I'm going to ask the bailiff to approach you with the Martha's People's Exhibit 13. Were those the photographs, friction ridge lifts, latent prints that you were provided from the Illinois State Police? Yes. Are you doing from the fingerprints, please? <clears throat> Specifically, in the file, was there a latent print on the exterior driver's door handle as shown in People's Exhibit 54, if you go to the next slide, and People's Exhibit 55? Uh, yes, there were. Did you compare the latent print that was found on the exterior door handle of that Toyota Avalon to the known standard from the defendant Bradley? Yes, I did. What did you find about the latent print on that Toyota Avalon to the print from the defendant Bradley? I found that the latent print from the exterior door handle was made by the person whose prints appear on the card marked Bradley S. Yawn. Was there also a palm print found on the, I'm sorry, was there also a print found on the driver's side on the back passenger door? Yes, there was. Did you compare that print to the print on the card marked Bradley on the defendant? Yes. What did you find about the print on the driver's side back passenger door of that Toyota Avalon? I found that that latent print on the back passenger door uh, was made by the person whose prints appear on the card marked Bradley S. Yawn. On the left side of the passenger, left side of the door, on the passenger side of the car, in People's Exhibit 56, was there a palm print that was found? Yes, there was. And did you compare that palm print to a palm print on a card marked palm print of Bradley Yawn? Yes, I did. What did you find when you compared the palm print on the Toyota Avalon to the palm print on the card of the defendant? I found that the palm print on the uh, passenger side left of the door, uh, that palm print was made by the person whose palm prints appear on a card marked Bradley S. Yawn. Were you also asked to examine? Were you also asked to examine a knife to see if there are any prints that latent prints that could be found on the knife? Yes. Now, when you looked at that knife, were you optimistic about getting prints from the handle of that knife? 
That's a bad question. Very. Let, me, let, me, let me rephrase the question. When prints, is it easier to get prints off of a smooth surface or a rough surface? It is easier to find prints on a smooth surface. And if its surface is rough, does it make it more difficult or more unlikely that prints will be left? Yes. Did you look at a particular knife in this case? Yes, I did. And did you look at the handle of that knife? Yes, I did. What did you find with regard to the handle of that knife? Uh, that, that particular knife had like a some kind of cord wrapped around the handle. And in your experience with the Illinois State Police, and specifically in the area of fingerprints, was that a good surface or a likely surface to contain prints? Uh, the handle was not a good surface for me to find latent prints. In fact, did you find any latent <clears throat> prints? Objection, Your Honor. Grounds? This is irrelevant. There's been no test done or no, there's been nothing concerning prints on a cloth corded handle and we've already cleared up there was no DNA from either defendant on this cloth corded handle. What is Mr. Jones getting at? Well, I haven't heard any evidence about DNA on a cloth covered handle so the jury will be instructed to disregard your statement in that regard but I will overrule your objection. You may answer the question. Were there any prints that you found on the knife? No, there were no uh, latent prints suitable for comparison on the knife. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Any cross-examination, Mr. Young? Um, in reference to 409, can you stated you uh, observed a fingerprint, correct? That's correct. I, I can't. I can't hold that with one finger, could I? I can't, it's not possible to hold that can with one finger, is it? Objection, Your Honor, relevance? Relevance is there's alleged to be found a fingerprint on a can. I'll overrule the objection. You may answer if you know. Uh, it would, could be possible if you could balance it. Uh, Good at balancing. Uh, and, and did you, in order to hold that can like I am right now, you would expect more than one fingerprint, correct? Uh, I don't expect any fingerprints. Uh, I'm looking for some. I don't always find prints. And uh, on that can, you analyze the whole can, obviously, the, the diameter of the can, where one would hold a can at. Any, any pot, any spot on that can. Um, I, I do see it possible that one could hold a can and drop it and there'd be prints left. I don't concede that. Um, is there a question, Mr. Young? Yeah, yes, there is. Uh, Your Honor, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to form it. I apologize. I find this pretty ridiculous, so I'm attempting to form it. Objection, Your Honor. Again, Mr. Young, you're to ask the witness questions, not... Yes. On that can, did you find any smears where there might have been fingerprints, where there might have been fingers holding it? Uh, I didn't make note of, of that. I only make note of when I find a suitable print to compare. And when I mean smears, I want to clarify, if I was to drop a can, the right thumb print would have smeared, potentially. You didn't find any of that, and you didn't look for it, correct? I didn't make a note of anything like that. Thank you, Mr. Long. Uh, that's all I have, Your Honor. Can you redirect? No, Your Honor. We'd ask that the witness be released from his subpoena. Mr. Young. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. Needs to stay. No, Your Honor. Uh, right, so you may step down. Thank you. Thank you. And you're released from your witness subpoena and free to go. Does the state have any further witnesses at this time? No, Your Honor. Uh, at this point, the people would rest our case. Right. You're somewhat close to the noon hour, and the people have now rested. Why don't we go to lunch until 12.45, it now being 11.15.
before the jury is excused for the lunch break. I must admonish you that you are not to do any independent investigation or research on any subject, place, or person relating to the case. This means you are not to go outside the courtroom for any information concerning the case, parties, lawyers, issues, or terms used, or to visit any place described or do any independent examination, measurement, or testing of facts. What you may have seen or heard outside the courtroom is not evidence. This also includes any press, radio, or television programs, and it also includes any information available on the Internet. You must not use the Internet or any other sources to research for any information about the case or the law which applies to the case. Such programs, reports, and information are not evidence, and your verdict must not be influenced in any way by such material. During the course of the trial, do not text, tweet, blog, communicate by any means to anyone, or provide information personally, in writing, or electronically to anyone about this case. Not even your own families, or friends, courtroom personnel, and also not, e not even amongst yourselves until instructed otherwise. Lawyers, parties, and witnesses are not permitted to speak with you about any subject, even if unrelated to this case, until after the case is over and you are discharged from your duties as jurors. It is your duty to report any such contact to me immediately. Please wear your juror badges when remaining in the area of the courthouse or nearby restaurants while serving as jurors. Again, we will be in recess until 1245. Wisdom, you Follow me. Jury instructions over the noon hour. Mr. Jones, are you ready to do a jury instruction conference? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we do have new copies from the copies we uh, gave this morning. Um, so there were a couple errors that we, we fixed. Yes. Right, Mr. Uh, Young, are you ready for the jury instruction conference? Uh, if you would give us approximately 10 minutes, Your Honor, if I'd confer with. Why don't we take a 15-minute recess till 11.30, use the facilities if necessary. We'll reconvene at 11.30 to begin that conference. Just before we take a recess, um, obviously we're starting at 12.45. The defense has asked that Heidi Young, uh, Ilsa Terrell, and Tim Schmidt all either be kept under subpoena or, or subpoenaed. They are not in the courthouse right now. I don't. If, if he's going to call them as witnesses this afternoon or tomorrow, we need to know that so that we can have them here um, for that. Um, so I need the, the court to inquire of him what he's planning on doing this afternoon so that we can make sure whatever witnesses he needs are here. All right. So, Mr. Yon. Your Honor, I would be calling Ruth Bowden and Summers today, I believe. or Sheriff Wagner, ex-Sheriff Wagner. Bowden, Summers, and Wagner, those three? Th them are the potential witnesses today, Your Honor. So we'll be in recess at this point till 1130. Please rise.
forgot my keys.
did a walk around. I know this. Y'all uh, observed, I guess, Bottom Road in the area, correct? Okay. Uh, did y'all observe the, I believe it's something called Navite Landing or Navite Road or something? Navite Landing Road? Did y'all walk? walk? We walked. You walked that? And looked around, obviously. Probably looking for a cell phone glasses, huh? For anything else, yeah, I would think nothing more specific. Now. Yeah, all right. Thank Getting some tomato sauce on a video. You found your snake? How big was it?
Thank you. All right, we will take up jury instruction conference in 21 CF 715. Assistant State's Attorney Jones and Kecker present. Mr. Young's present pro se, but with standby counsel, Mr. Nelson. All right, so Mr. Jones or Ms. Keck, have you provided the defendant with a copy of your proposed jury instructions? We have, Your Honor. Your Honor, these are just updated from what we have provided, I believe it was two weeks ago, in that previously um, the victim's name was spelled out. I changed that to initials. And then 2.01, um, I believe, said aggravated vehicular invasion instead of hijacking. So that was modified. Other than that, uh, everything should be the same that we previously provided to the court, Mr. Yon. And I did provide him new copies this morning, just like the court. All right. The jury verdict on the aggravated vehicular guilty, not guilty, also says invasion. So that needs to be corrected, but we've got instructions to take up before those. All right, Mr. Yon, do you have any proposed jury instructions? Um. Um, Your Honor, uh, I would ask the only additional ones to be included are 310, right, of an attorney or attorney's investigator to interview witnesses, 311 prior inconsistent statements, and 317 testimony of an accomplice. All right. So those are the three you are requesting. So as far as the 1.01, the jury instruction I read to the jurors prior to commencing trial, that will be provided to them in the packet that will not be reread to them. I'm sorry, that'll be uh, 1.01A. As far as the instruction 1.01 proposed by the state, any objection to that being given, Mr. Yon? Which one was that, Your Honor? 1.01. No. And 1.01A is the preliminary cautionary instructions before opening statement. As previously stated, that one has already been given, will not be reread. The 1.01B implicit bias. Any objection to that being given, Mr. Young? No, no, not at all. 1.02, the objection to 1.02. Judge, we've given two versions of that. All right. There are two versions in the packet provided to the court and to the defendant, the difference being the second paragraph, and that will be dependent upon your testimony, your testifying or not. If you testify, then the first version would normally be given. If you exercise your right not to testify, then the second version would be given. Any objection to one of those instructions, depending upon your choice to testify or not? Uh, if I choose to testify, I would say that the second one, one second. Uh, Your Honor, if I choose to testify, I'd, I'd say that the second one be dismissed. That would be what the instructions so instruct, yes. Okay, so no objection? No. 1.03, arguments of counsel. Any objection to that instruction? Arguments of counsel? 1.03. No, Your Honor. 
be given 1.05 jury note taking. Any objection to that instruction, Mr. Yon? No. 1.09A, civil extended media coverage. The A was given to the jurors prior to commencement of trial. It will be provided in the packet to them, but not reread. But we have 1.09B, which is suggested to be read at the end of trial. So any objection to 1.09B being given to the jurors? No, Your Honor, no. We have 2.01. Any objection? Uh, give me one moment. I, I have two of them. They are, I believe, the same. Your Honor, this is the one that I did give him a new copy. Yeah, there was a aggravated vehicular hijacking is the corrected version. Originally, it stated aggravated vehicular invasion. I guess the offense on the second line. And I believe that it's called vehicular invasion, isn't it, in the instructions? No, the charge is aggravated vehicular hijacking. Okay, yeah, and there's no objection yet. So we'd be keeping the one that says hijacking. Correct. 2.02, .02, any objection? No. 2.03, any objection? No. 2.04, if you choose to not testify, that would normally be given. If you choose to testify and do testify, I mean, if you testify, uh, basically that would not be given. I understand that. Any objection? No. 3.02. Any objection? Give me one second, Your Honor. Um, no, Your Honor. 3.06-3.07. Judge, depending on whether or not the defendant... Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. We are we're leaving it the way it is. Any objection to 3.0 or 3.06-3.07 being given, Mr. Young? Oh, uh, Your Honor, I did not make a statement. So, give me one second. Your Honor, I... Yeah, I didn't have to object to this one. Uh, there is no evidence before the jury that uh, I made a statement relating to the offense charge and the information. Mr. Jones? Judge, there was evidence that Tina Lohman said that the defendant had made statements to her and those statements that she made to her, that the defendant allegedly made to her, were referenced to this jury. That's the basis for this instruction, the statements that were made not to police, but by the defendant, allegedly, to the victim of the offense. Your Honor, Your Honor there's uh, no evidence of that. All right, I'm going to overrule the objection. As you recall, the husband, Tim Schmidt, had described what Ms. Lohman had told him happened, and part of that included statements by the male had raped her in specific. And so they're attributing those statements to you. So I'll give the instruction that can be over your objection, Mr. John. 3.11. You had requested 3.11 yourself, Mr. John. The state has 3.11 within the packet. Yes, sir. Any objection to that being given? No. So it will be given without objection. 3.12. Any objection? Judge, that will 
that's only if a particular witness testifies at this point. We don't have any evidence of a witness that's been impeached by a prior conviction. No objection, Your Honor. All right. So now we're given if a future witness is impeached with their prior convictions, that has not occurred yet. So it will be given if that occurs without objection. 3.13. Any objection? And Judge, that's only if the defendant testifies. No, Your Honor. That will be given only if the defendant testifies. 3.17. Your Honor, at this point, we'll include it. At this point, we have not had the testimony of an accomplice. So if that issue arises, it can be given. If that issue arises, but as of right now, it has not. So that would be the normal instruction to be given if an accomplice testifies. Yes, that's fine. All right. So that will be given without objection if an accomplice does testify. 5.03, instruction on accountability. Any objection? Yes, I do object. All right. What's the objection? Your Honor, I can't be responsible for what another person does. Okay. Unfortunately, Mr. Yon, the law holds you accountable for the actions of any co-conspirator or accomplice. And so that's the law. And so I'll have to instruct the jury on the law, and that can be over your objection. And if a person gets mad and says something, it's automatically true, huh? Well, Mr. Yon, again, I'm just taking up jury instructions with you at this time. I'm not discussing human nature. All right. 5.06. Any objection? Again, I think this coincides with the objection to 5.03. I'm not responsible for what somebody else does. Again, the law may hold you responsible for such. And so I will give the instruction over your objection. That's quite good. 11.53, definition of home invasion. Any objection? No. No, Your Honor, no. I'll be given without objection. 11.54, the issues in home invasion involving dangerous weapon. Any objection? Your Honor, the fifth proposition, if you give me 30 seconds to talk to Mr. Moss. No objection, Your Honor. All right. As to the paragraph or fifth proposition pointed out by Mr. Yon, are we referring to the victim alleged as CL or Christina Lohman? I would like it to be consistent throughout the instructions. Your Honor, I'm referring to, I wanted to confer with Mr. Nelson on the fact that there is no evidence of a knife, and I wanted to ask him if he'd help me on determination further with that issue. All right. But you indicated no objection, and so. Whether there would be a different proposition to be placed forth or not. Well, 
let's address the CL issue. Are we going to refer to the alleged victim as CL throughout the instructions, or Christina Lohman, or Tina Lohman, or Tina uh, Lohman and Schmidt? I, I think under case law in the jury instructions, we have to say CL. All right. So as, as long as it's consistent yeah. throughout. As I've been saying the whole time, yes. All right. Excellent. And the state has not. Okay, so 11.54, instruction on home invasion with criminal sexual assault. Any objection? Um, no, Your Honor. Instruction 8.01, definition of kidnapping. Any objection? No. 8.01, as well as the prior instructions, will be given without objection. 8.04, definition of aggravated kidnapping. Any objection? Um, yeah, I'd have to object. I don't think the definition of aggravated kidnapping is simply because there may have been criminal sexual assault during the kidnapping or... I mean, aggravated kidnapping sounds to be as if it was in a mean sense, not predicated on criminal sexual assault. Mr. Keck or Mr. Jones, is that the IPI form? It's the IPI form. Under the IPI, obviously, there are many subparagraphs. And so specifically, it is 8.04. The first line says a person who kidnaps another for the offense commits the offense of aggravated kidnapping when he, and then paragraph one, two, we're going down to paragraph three, and paragraph three is commits, and then it's a blank, and that's where you put the, put the offense, and the offense here is criminal sexual assault upon the victim. All right, so that will be given over defense objection. Your Honor, uh, there are other propositions. Objection? No. All right. So 8.04 will be given without objection. 8.05A issues in aggravated kidnapping. Any objection? If you would give me one second, please. No, Your Honor, no objection. 8.05a will be given without objection. 14.23. Any objection? Give me one moment.
No, Your Honor. 14.23 will be given without objection. 14.24, any objection? Objection. Eleven point five five. Any objection? No. Even without objection. Eleven point six five E. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Even without objection. Eleven point fifty seven. Any objection? One second, please. No. Again, without objection, eleven point fifty eight. Any objection? The third proposition is uh, quite a bit different. Oh, well, hang on one moment. Yeah, it's quite a bit different than the propositions here. So I'd object, yeah, uh, I do not see This proposition. Where it states uh, he is legally responsible. For one or for one or one for whose con conduct he is legally responsibly le legally res responsible to later threaten to use a dangerous weapon other than a firearm. Get a respond. Judge, under the accountability instruction, the accomplice instruction, we are to insert the phrase or one for whose conduct he is legally responsible into the propositions where that is an issue. That's what we've done, and that's what we're supposed to do pursuant to the Illinois pattern criminal jury instruction. Court will give the instruction finding such to be an accurate rep recitation of Illinois law over Your defendant's right. objection. 14.13. Your Honor, I'm looking at it right here. I'm looking at 1158 right here in the IPI instructions, 2023 manual. I suggest you go to the accountability instruction, which is 5.03, and there under is where it's going to advise you exactly of what Mr. Jones just recited. 
So again, I'll give it over your objection. Um, 14.13. No objection. We'll Given without objection. Fourteen point one four. No. No objection. No. All right. We'll be given without objection. Twenty six point oh one. No, Your Honor, no objection. Well, it refers to aggravated vehicular invasion. Judge, that's one that we need to change, and, and we've circled that, and we'll make that change and provide everyone with a corrected copy using the word hijacking. All right. Get that changed, but no objection once they change aggravated vehicular invasion to hijack. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So that will be given without objection. And Judge, with the be... verdict forms, we'll have to do the same thing on the verdict form. I see that. We have verdict form 26.02 regarding home invasion, dangerous weapon. There's a not guilty and 26.05 verdict form with a guilty. Any objection to those being given? No, Your Honor. And then regarding 26.02 and 26.05 verdict forms of guilty and not guilty for home invasion, criminal sexual assault. Any objection to those being given? No. We have the same verdict forms 2602 and 26.05, the guilty and not guilty of aggravated kidnapping. Any objection? No. Those will be given without objection. 2601 and 2605. Guilty and not guilty verdict forms for aggravated vehicle vehicular invasion are going to be corrected to hijacking. After that correction, is there any objection? No. We'll be given without objection. 2602 and 2605, guilty and not guilty verdict for aggravated criminal sexual assault. Any objection? No. Okay, we'll be given without objection. Instruction 2602 and 2605, guilty and not guilty verdicts regarding residential burglary. Any objection? No. They will be given without objection. The Senate has proposed 3.11 and 3.12, which are included in the set of instructions already. He's also suggesting we give 3.10 regarding the uh, attorney or rights of parties to interview witnesses. Any objection to that being given by the state? No, Your Honor. We'll provide that to me, and we will include that in the instructions. Any other instructions for the state? Not at this point, Your Honor. We would reserve the right if anything else comes up to address that with the court. But at this point, nothing. Any other instructions for defense at this time? No, Your Honor. All right. We... Uh, Your Honor, I have something to address. Is it a possibility I could recall Miss Massajewski? She released from her witness subpoena. She was. She was released from her witness subpoena, Mr. John, so it'll be on you to try to get her back. We already went through her examination and we allowed you to question further, hoping to have her excused so she wouldn't have to wait around. So it's on you to try and get her back if you need to call her as a witness. All right, we're going to be adjourned until 1245 when the jury's back. Hopefully we've got time for lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Please
We'll go the other way. Was that the Jerry and Rick, uh, even though I mean, they're pissed because you know, Josh is high class. So the guy is just. Yeah, they're under some of the class. They're so of class. Yeah. I think that's totally different. Yeah. And we set this up too. Right. Like, like, there's not much hope to do that. The rich ones are in the face. Yeah, you know. So. And he's not really at this bit of a defense. Did we add him to the witness list? Yeah. I think you just say, I don't know, we ask for this. Just as a number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Facebook ni semua.
first card I was like, oh no, I'm here to get no pig. And uh, uh, which uh, card do you want? Um, well, I think I should be. I need to be able to get pull my computer. All right. So, Perfect. <coughs> it's kind of fine switching sides. You just never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I like this entire channel. What is this with your proctologist? I don't go to a proctologist. Not yet. Trial's still young. Lord. 
copy all those. Each individual picture I have to go in and individually open and print off. There's like 50 files to So. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Set for the court is now ready to convene with Honorable Roger B. Thompson, Judge Presiding. Good to see We are back on the record in 2021 CF 715, People versus Bradley S. Yon. Mr. Jones and Mrs. Keck appearing for the people. Mr. Yon appearing pro se with standby counsel, Mr. Nelson. And when we took our lunch recess, the people had rested. Mr. Jones, anything further on behalf of the people at this time? No, Your Honor. All right, so the case is going to move over to your side, Mr. Yon. You do not have to present any evidence. Your Honor, if I... All right, however, if you would like to do so, I need to do so at this time. Are you intending to call witnesses? Yes, Your Honor, however, I have an issue. Talk into your microphone, see if it's going to give us feedback. Yes, Judge, I have a. All right. Sorry. Yes. Uh, your Honor, I have an issue to take up. I've conferred with Mr. Nelson about uh, getting some uh, documents printed off real quick for exhibits. Uh, he stated, well, he was going to attempt to do it within about five minutes, but he said it would probably take about a bit longer, approximately 15 to 20. Um, he's willing to do that. I was going to see if maybe the courts could uh, recess for an additional few minutes so that I could get these exhibits printed off that I've been trying to get printed off for months. We'll recess to one o'clock to attempt to allow that to occur, uh, Mr. Young, but I, you know, we're inconveniencing the jury for being here and I want to limit that inconvenience as much as possible. So I don't expect this to occur repeatedly. No, sir. So come prepared for the trial, but we will reconvene at one o'clock. We'll be in recess. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. This session of the court now stands in recess. Thank you. 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 Thank 
Humber that makes it as much. Humber curve. I just start doing
Listening to my kids sing Sanctuary. Listening to Sad Blue from working on the closing. You're going to play a Sanctuary song. No. Do you know the song? I don't. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Okay, before we leave today. It's like, is it one of the Christian songs? It's like 10 lines. It's very short. What would you do if I just did it right now? I shake my head and say, folks, that's my trap. Okay. This is a four minute, 49 second version. I love that. Good God. From the West Angeles Kajik Mass Choir and Congregation. Maybe it's not good. No. No, Lord. Yeah. Okay, no. after the court, I'm playing it. Mm -hmm. okay. Better than me singing it. With me singing it, it would cause everything. That is completely true. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's like the 30 second versions of this. <clears throat> there's TikToks of it. I mean, that's kind of She should be with her man the entire time, but she, she wouldn't need a phone. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. The session circuit court is now ready to meet Donald Roger B. Thompson, just presiding. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Back on the record in the 21 CF 715, People versus Brad the Young. All Parties and council previously mentioned the record or are still present. Did you get the reports printed out you needed in no, exhibits? Your, your Honor, I, I did not. I only was able to get a few of them printed out, and I, I still need to set up a monitor to display these exhibits, too. I talked about this days ago. Um, uh, I'm going to need a little bit of time to be prepared. I, I, I hope you go ahead and get this over with you. But, I mean, I have to be able to do certain things in order to. Mr. Nelson was only able to obtain about approximately 14, 15 copies. Um, How much more time do you perceive that you're going to need, Mr. Young? I 
half an hour and 40 minutes. I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, not much I can do about it. And there's plenty that should have been done before this time, Mr. Yon. The time for trial prep is before trial, but I will recess for 30 minutes. You get done and ready to present your case because we're going to do that in 30 minutes, sir. We'll be in recess till 1.30. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. The session report, I'll the recess. Because that's where they come out at 114 row ones. They got like the the home tunnel right there. But that's the only one. Have you watched the Netflix thing? It came out last night. Oh, I seen it there. But that quarterback documentary, it's on Netflix now. And it's all. And LeBron had on the women's court. He had a bunch of girl trucks in his home. I was like,
He used to be a cowboy. I like the cowboys. Mm -hmm. like, now that he's, but who do you think? I don't like that. I don't like what he got from all the peers.
Um, yeah, or just, I mean, we can use that screen and just prompt it up on something. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Mr. Nelson's chair. Yeah. 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 Is he grabbing another screen? Okay. Can you just turn this projector off? Yeah, I can turn the projector off. That's what I would do. And then you could use that or screen. Blank screen. No, but then it'll have that blue. If you blank screen it, it turns blue. Oh, that's right. You'd have to, you're going to turn the projector well, off. Yeah, you can turn the projector off. That's what I would do. And then you could go on to that one. That, yeah, if we blink, this will turn off this projector, and then you would be able to project onto that screen. Yeah, like that. And then you should be able to now. just in case. I know he's brought it all the way here. What is it? Sir, do you want to file a report? You know, I can carry that too. I know you can carry it too. I didn't know you were going to carry it.
but I would agree. But no, you have to come on. Yeah. Those are just the pictures they took, I'm sure, of the family that they sent along. That's great.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. This session of the court is now ready to be in Donald for Roger B. Thompson, Judge Presiding. Thank you. Please be seated. And 21 CF 715, Mr. Jones and Mrs. Keck appearing for the people, Mr. Yon appearing pro se with standby counsel, Mr. Nelson. We are now at 1.37 or so in the afternoon, and Mr. Yon, are you now prepared to begin with your defense? Your Honor, I'm about as prepared as going to be. Okay, and are you going to be calling a witness? Uh, Officer Ruth Bowden. Okay. All right, so let's have the jurors brought back in, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. This session of the court is now reconvened. Please be seated. Thank you. You're back on the record, and the jurors are now all present in the jury box. And Mr. Yon, do you care to present any evidence? Uh, Officer Ruth Bowden, Your Honor. All right. If we could have Officer Ruth Bowden brought to the courtroom. Come forward, ma'am, to the deputy circuit clerk. And raise your right hand, she'll swear you in. Okay, so I'm going to say the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Okay, see so over here to my right, the witness stand. when you're ready with your questions. Your Officer Ruth Bowden, correct? Yes. Uh, would you state your name and credentials for the record, um, It's Ruth Bowden. I'm a deputy with Adams County Sheriff's Department. And uh, how long have you been with Adams County Sheriff's Department? Um, approximately 19 and a half years. And uh, you're employed as a street deputy at this current moment? Correct. And uh, on November 9th of 2021, you were doing the same occupation or were you in a different... Uh, same, same patrol deputy. You're obviously familiar with the matters we're here on today, uh, November 9th of 2021. Uh, and you were to be the first deputy on scene to an alleged home invasion and sexual assault, correct? Um, there were two of us deputies that arrived approximately the same time, uh, Sergeant Joe Lohmeyer and I. Um, do you remember who arrived first? No, it was it would have been within a minute or two of the same. Um, could you uh, also relate to us the uh, other officers that come in behind you? I couldn't. There was a lot. I, I don't know exactly who all was there. It'd be on our dispatch ticket. Yes, yes, I understood. Um, Summers, sound familiar? Deputy Miller? I believe they were there at some point. I don't know exactly when. 
You're not for sure. Uh, Sergeant McMahon. I believe I, yeah, he was there. Mm -hmm. um, upon, uh, excuse me, upon arriving to the scene, what did you proceed to do once you, once you arrived there? Um, uh, Sergeant Lohmeyer and I talked to the initial caller, uh, Timothy Schmidt. And uh, where did you talk to him at? <sighs> Uh, I believe we initially talked to him, I think it was outside towards the garage area or the driveway maybe. Upon speaking to him, what did he relay to you? Um, just pretty much what he had relayed to the dispatch center, um, that there was some sort of incident that happened um, involving his wife uh, where she was uh, um, hijacked in her vehicle, um, sexually assaulted and some things were stolen from their house um, and a vehicle was also stolen. And uh, could you relate to those of us here today your further proceedings after that, what you did upon talking to Mr. Smith? I don't understand the... After, after you talked to Mr. S husband, Mr. Smith, what did you proceed to do after that time? I mean, did we... You, did you enter the home? Yes, you, we eventually did enter the home. And eventually could you to the best of your recollection, do you remember approximately how long after you arrived, how long after you talked to Mr. Smith that you entered the home? I, I don't, to be honest. Not even an, an estimate? I'm not real sure. It could have been a half an hour? I don't believe it'd be that long. And uh, when you entered the home, what did you observe when you entered the home? Um, just, I know when we went, we walked through the garage, the open garage, and then there was a uh, walk-through door to enter the house. Uh, there was a uh, damage to the door, and there was shoe print on the door. Um, obviously, it appeared if it was a kick dead. Um, as we entered the home, um, we entered into, I believe it was the kitchen area, and there was an elderly female sitting um, on the ground inside. There's like an open concept floor plan inside kind of the kitchen into the living room area. And uh, in reference to the elderly female sitting inside where was she sitting um i believe so it was an open concept so i believe it was uh kind of where the kitchen and the dining room meet um kind of i think they had different floor surfaces if i remember correctly so into the kind of living room area uh, do you remember any object or piece of furniture she was sitting by um i believe she was pretty near um a chair and then there were some sofas in there too if i recall And uh, in your report, I, I have your report here. In your report, uh, you wrote that CL was on the floor and had to have help getting up from that floor. At one point she did, yes. And uh, specifically, you, you stated that she, and I quote, appeared upset and later needed help getting up. Would that be a correct assumption that she later needed help getting up? I don't, yeah, I don't think she needed help right away. I think, yeah, eventually at some point. But deputies did help her up. Yeah, I don't recall who did, but somebody did, yes. Um, do you recall where they helped her up to? Uh, I don't. And uh, I want to ask about the clothing she was wearing when you entered the home. To the best of your recollection, do you remember what clothing she was wearing? I don't she naked potentially or no uh she would have had clothing on i just don't remember the exact uh garments she had on and uh you did not help her up to the couch no um that couch uh obviously you you enter the scene and you what steps did you take after entering the scene and upon seeing her on the floor? I don't understand what... Did, uh, when you entered the scene, what? what steps did you further take? In terms of... Securing the scene, speaking to anyone? Okay. Um, I know we entered and I know Sergeant Lohmeyer had spoken to uh, Christina. She was visibly upset, um, crying, and um, she had just kind of given us a kind of fragmented statements on what had happened initially. And uh,
And uh, do you recall deputies having to assist Loman off the, excuse me, CL off the floor due to any certain reason? I don't know. I don't know why. You, you stated you arrived within minutes of uh, Deputy Lohmeyer. Uh On the call for service sheet, I believe it states 627. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, in your profession, what is an administrator? In terms, usually it's one of the more head in terms administrator of an officer. Yes, yeah, so like in, in your ranks, in your level, is there such a thing called an administrator? Well, an administrator usually is a higher level. Um, like in ours would be like the sheriff, chief deputies, sergeants. And were, and were there any administrators local? Um, if we're referring to the same thing, like a sergeant, Sergeant Lohmeyer would have been the patrol, you know, administrator, if you will. And uh, there were no other administrators there throughout this time. You you obviously stayed around the scene till I believe it was approximately 9 p.m., a little bit after. Okay. Um, were there any other administrators there during this time? If you're speaking of higher ranking people, yes. I, I believe I did see the sheriff there at one point, Sheriff Wagner. Um, and I know Sergeant McMahon I, was there, Sergeant Lohmeyer. Um, and I, I don't remember if anybody else of the higher ranking were, were there that I recall. Uh, outside of the police and law enforcement, were there any other people? present um at points yes and uh do you remember what point this was um i know when we initially got there um for, from what i recall it was sergeant lohmeyer and i and then um timothy schmidt who resides there and also his wife and i know at some point um i believe it was a few of her daughters arrived i don't know the times but they were there at some point pretty pretty close to i don't think it was really very long but <laughs> You say you observed an elderly woman on the floor and she was frantic or giving frantic responses. Obviously the floor is not a comfortable position. Is there a reason that y'all didn't immediately help her up or get her to a safer and more comfortable position? I don't know. Don't recall. And uh, you relayed in your, in your report here that she was helped up to a couch. Can you shed some light on that? Um, if I had it in there, that must have been what happened, but I don't I don't really recall what she was up to. Um, and uh, just based on your recollection, mm -hmm. and the floor plan, knowing the floor plan, about how far do you think that couch was from that position she was seated on the floor? Um, if I had to guess in feet, maybe six to eight feet, roughly, eight. give or take. And uh, you spoke to Timothy Schmidt and you probably heard some things. CL was stating, uh, I want to talk about further procedure you took in this incident. This is a very big incident in the area and uh, it's commonly known. So I, I would expect an officer of law to maybe remember a bit of procedure they took and. I'd ask you further to provide any, recollect any recollection of procedure you took upon and after speaking to CL and Timothy Schmidt. I just, I know Sergeant Lohmeyer was there, who was my supervisor, so um, I know he spoke to her uh, more in depth than I did, and I know I did walk, um, I kind of, you know, did check around the area, I know, walked around with Timothy at one point. In the area, you mean the home? The residence. The residence. Mm -hmm. Residence, okay. And uh, do you, did, did Officer Lohmeyer leave quickly or did he hang around the scene himself? Um, he was there uh, quite a while. Quite a while. So you, you proceeded to look around the home and probably a form of securing it and looking to see what had been ransacked or went through? I know Timothy had kind of showed me around to, you know, show me things that were kind of askew or out of the ordinary of the way they would have left it. Um, uh, 
in reference to askew, the word you use the words askew and out of the ordinary, not the way that he would have left them. Uh, you you obviously entered the scene not too long after the 911 phone call. Uh, the 911 phone calls alleged to be at 6.09 and you arrived at 6.27. When you walked around the scene, did you see anything out of the ordinary? Um, I know when we initially got there, um, there was a garage, uh, the garage, well, initially by the driveway, there's like a patch of grass and there was car tracks through it, which was kind of odd. And there was um, items on the garage floor, kind of, almost in a pile um, and then of course as we walk through the uh, walk through garage door into the house area there's a shoe print on the door which you know is, is kind of odd and there was damage to the door and door jam and as we walk in of course there's some things in the kitchen I think a dr drawer had been gone through there was a knife on the floor in the kitchen and there was also a um, like a spray bottle of cleaner that was on the ground and uh, the house appeared to be a very cl you know clean house so that seemed odd to me, you know, in my initial contact. When, when you say it appeared to be very clean, uh, it wasn't cluttered or messy? Um, not in my opinion. Um, it seemed to be a clean house other than the things that looked out of the ordinary to me, just in first contact. And uh, you uh, come to the conclusion in your report that one of the kitchen cabinets had been gone through, correct? I believe I had that in there, yes. And uh, you know how many appeared to be gone through? I don't. Was it several, just a singular? I, I don't. I don't know if I had it in there, but. I don't believe you did. I just wanted to inquire. Okay, I'm not something. sure, yeah. Um, and you also stated there was a knife on the floor and a cleaning, a cleaner, can of cleaner. Correct. Um, the word ransack, I'd like to ask you, uh, do you know the word ransack? I do. Could you relay that? Based on your opinion, what ransack means? Um, something, when it's ransacked, uh, if it's an orderly house, it would be things uh, thrown, possibly, you know, out of drawers maybe, or um, maybe food on the ground, uh, maybe paperwork, mail thrown on the ground, things of that nature. And uh, ransack is similar to what you stated. Uh, ultimately, it is search thoroughly and to plunder. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Uh, the House of State to be ransacked, Your Honor. <laughs> All right, you need to ask the witness questions rather than making statements, though, Mr. Young. So I'm going to sustain the objection and we can move on with questioning your witness. And uh, husband, Smith, he pointed out all of these things to you. Do you remember what he pointed out specifically? Um, <clears throat> I can't remember if he pointed out the the kitchen itself. Um, that was visible right when he walked in. I know we did walk through the house at a little bit later time and uh, he showed me a bedroom um, which uh, I think I remember he said I believe some drawers were gone through or something and there was a if I recall a liquor bottle that was pushed over in a wallet um, out of a drawer and I think there was some jewelry taken he had informed me and then we did walk down to the basement they have a large uh, open basement and he advised in the middle section of the basement there were lots of drawers that were gone through and pulled out um, which wasn't normal and then also um, along a different wall there's a wall safe and he advised somebody must have moved uh, I think there was a piece of wood in front of it um, and it was moved and it um, he believes somebody tried to get into it and that, that basement uh, did that basement appear as a normal living area one one that someone occupied regularly um, that I, I don't really recall that part it wasn't cluttered or potentially used as a storage spot? Uh, I honestly don't remember. You, uh, you're obviously familiar with guns, correct, as an officer. Uh, did you see any gun paraphernalia? 
I don't remember that. Um, Mr. Schmidt, he, as you related in your, in your report, he pointed out that lights had been turned on, cabinets opened in the kitchen, and the safe. Um, does that seem to be accurate? Uh, I don't believe the safe was opened, from it what was, I recall. I, I apologize. He just pointed out the safe, and that's what you referenced. Didn't you? He did. Yeah, he did show me where the safe was in the basement, but I, uh, it didn't seem like it was access to him. And did, did Mr. Schmidt relate to you anything that he knew was missing? Um, I believe he said something about some jewelry in one of the bedrooms he took me into. Um, and I know, uh, I want to say that's all he knew for sure was missing at that time. I know, you know, at that time we wouldn't have been able to go through the whole house or inventory anything specifically, but. And uh, by, the, by, the time of clue, con by the time of your concluding of walking through the scene, mm -hmm. the time you were done walking through the scene, could you give a brief estimate on how long you think you've been there? I have no idea. And uh, while you're doing this assessment of the home, do you recall where Officer Lohmeyer was? Um, he, I believe, stayed up with uh, Christina upstairs. And uh, during the concluding of your observation of the house being taken around the house when you come back up you obviously come back upstairs correct yes and it was you lohmeyer timothy and co correct yes and th there might have been more people there by that point i don't remember when other people came and uh to try to help shed some light uh once you arrived on the scene, did you do this assessment promptly? Was it a while after? I know, obviously, we had talked to him outside for a few minutes and then went inside. And I know she, uh, Christine, had given a few just fragmented statements. And I know uh, Sergeant Lohmeyer stayed up with her. And then Timothy had kind of showed me around. Um, it wasn't really long after we got there that I walked with him you know, throughout. Um, CL eventually went to the hospital, correct? Yes. And was that while you were there? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think she did go when I was still there. And uh, do you recall who took her? Um, I'm not 100%. I thought she went with her husband, but I, I'm not 100% on that. Yeah, uh, that is what's in your report. I just wanted to, okay. to make sure. Um, do you recall approximately what time she left for the no, hospital? I don't. It, it was maybe a while after you were there? It had been a while, yes. And uh, did you say 45 minutes, hour? I really don't know. Cause Just an estimate. I don't know. And uh, when she left for the hospital, there was obviously others there, correct? Correct. Do you recall who may have been there then? There was a lot of people there. Um, I couldn't tell you every person, no. If um, with our dispatch tickets, though, any officers would have been, um, that would be on the dispatch ticket. I, I find it hard that you don't remember. Objection, Your Honor. Argument. There was sustained. And uh, do you recall anybody in the home? as far as the rest of the people who were there? Mm -hmm. At different times, yes. Uh, different times, such as maybe after you did your assessment of the scene? Yes. And uh, in particular, was there a daughter there that went through the home looking for things for the declarant or victim CL? I know there were, I believe at least two of the daughters showed up. And what were they doing while you were there? Um, I mean, they were in the house. I didn't, you know, keep track of them completely. And it's a pretty big house, correct? Correct. And uh, they were not in your sight at all times? No, they wouldn't have been. 
And uh, you remained on the scene until CSI Field arrived, true? I was there, yes. And uh, can you tell me how, how you proceeded after that? With? With, in reference to this whole, this whole night, uh, what did you proceed to do after that time? Um, she, I know Sergeant Lohmeyer contacted her when she got there. Um, she proceeded to take evidence and do what she needed to do with her protocols. And you just hung around and secured the scene, or? I stayed there, yes. You, approximately how long did you stay there? I, mean, I have no idea. You don't? It'd remember. be on the dispatch ticket, any, any information where, of my whereabouts. You would give me one moment. And you are at S11, correct? Correct. Do you recall if it was later in the night that you left? Was it early in the a.m. of the next day? Um, it was, I know I was there for quite a while, and then I was instructed at one point to go to Blessing Hospital. Um, for I believe uh, the crime scene tech for the state, I believe it was Brandy Field, um, in reference to some shoe prints, shoe impressions. Yes. yes. Um, so that was quite a bit later. It was a while, yeah, after, after she got there. Um, she went and kind of did what she needed to do, and then I was told to go to the hospital to meet with a couple of subjects and take some photos to forward to her. When you say she did what she had to do, Correct. Uh, that's obviously taking pictures and analyzing a scene for forensics. Um, was she done by the time you went to obtain these pictures? No, she wouldn't have been. And uh, that knife that was on the floor, do you remember, do you recall what it looked like? I don't, just it was a knife, but I don't remember details of it. Just a simple knife, kitchen knife? I believe it was a kitchen knife. Uh, potentially maybe even a meat carving knife. I, I don't know much about knives, to be honest, kitchen knives. But it did appear to be it, a kit, regular kitchen knife. Correct. And uh, the spray can on the floor, do you remember what location that was in? Whereabouts it might have been? Uh, somewhere in the kitchen. Like I said, it was an open concept. I, from what I recall, it was in the kitchen close to where the living room area would be. So in the potential center median of a walkway, maybe? I don't remember that part. Give me one moment. Um, you obviously were directed to go to Blessing Hospital and take shoe prints. If you give me one moment, apologize. How many person's shoe prints did you take? It was several. It might have been, it might have been two, three, four. It was more than one, I do know that. And I just took photos of them, I didn't. And uh, what did you proceed to do with the photos? Um, I forwarded them to uh, my supervisor or a supervisor, uh, I believe I sent them to Sergeant Jake McMahon. And uh, if, if you recall, were there any Nikes in the shoes? I don't recall. As I stated earlier, there was a 911 call made. You're obviously aware of that or else you would not have responded to the scene, correct? Correct. And uh, are you aware that 
CL denied services. Objection, Your Honor. Seems facts not in evidence and call for hearsay. All the rule. Let me answer the question. Are you aware that CL denied services in such call? I'm not sure what your question. Are you aware that CL denied ambulatory services when someone made the phone call? Oh, I'm I'm not aware. And uh, I want to go back a little bit in reference in reference to CL. She was sitting on the floor. Did she have? How did she appear other than frantic? Physically, how did she appear? Um, she was sitting kind of odd with her legs to the side. I do remember that. Um, and I mean, she was, appeared she'd been crying. Um, and just didn't, didn't seem real happy. I mean, yeah. I had never met her before, but she seemed distraught in my opinion. And uh, you stated in your in your report, I, I apologize, I'm going to go back one more time in reference to the cabinet. You stated that there was a kitchen cabinet that had been gone through. Could you describe that? I don't recall. It wasn't an open door or a drawer, maybe? Whatever's in my report, I, I don't recall the exact details. Um, while you were there, while CL was still on the floor, or after being picked up, helped up to the couch, did you observe any blood? Um, are you asking on her or in the area or? On her or okay. in, the, in the area, anywhere? Um, I do remember what appeared to be a reddish smears um kind of uh, there was a green fabric chair which would have been in between the kitchen area into the living room so it would have been slightly into the living room area um and there were some reddish smears kind of below it kind of in front of it below uh, i apologize for going trying to go in depth uh, your report is very minimal it's objection your honor grounds argumentative calling the report minimal if we could ask the witness questions, Mr. Young. Yes, sir. Uh, did it appear she was bleeding a lot? I don't know if she was bleeding. I just said I saw red smears. Um, I'm not sure if it was blood or not. It probably wasn't enough to certify that it was blood, correct? I don't know. And uh, you, you talk about the, the chair, the green plaid chair. Was there any blood on that chair? Um, I don't know if there was blood, but there was like a discoloration on it. Your Honor, uh, if I could, I'd like to present a couple of exhibits of said chair. Are you needing the bailiff to take those to yes, the please. witness? Okay. This would be a close up of the chair and one Judge, of these. can we get an exhibit number? Do you have these labeled as defendants' exhibits, Mr. Young? On the Exhibit number 74 and they are under image Image 2341 and 2340. 
All right. Have you marked on the documents handed to the witness defendant's exhibit? No, Your, Your Honor, I did not have time. However, I do have them marked here in, in digital. And I have, I have provided the images with uh, state's attorneys also. We can have the bailiff return the exhibits to Mr. Yon so he can mark them as trial exhibits, defendant exhibit. And then if you would try your best to number them sequentially so we can keep track of what's been admitted and what's not and what exhibits you're referring to at the trial. We'll assist the jurors when we review and deliberate, as well as any appellate court who would have to reference those exhibits in the future. Now, Mr. Bailiff, you might assist us by providing him with the appended exhibit stickers. like to use the stickers just place those on the document you're going to be handing to the witness and there's a blank if you want to put whichever number you want to reference those by. Your Honor, there would be exhibit number one and number two images 2345 and 2339. All right. So the mail could return the now marked exhibits to the witness. Mr. Yon, if you would continue with your questions. Do you remember the, that chair? Yes. And is that the green plaid chair you were speaking of? It appears to be. These are black and white, but I believe it's the same pattern. And, uh, Your Honor, may I admit these into evidence? Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right. So defendants number one and number two are, are admitted with no objection. Your Honor, here is 2339. And that would be one of the exhibits you hold in your hand, correct? Correct. And that would be the other one, 2345. Correct. And does there appear to be any blood there? I don't know if there it would be blood, but it appears to be a discoloration. You stated that uh, officers helped her to the couch upon upon getting off the floor, correct? Somebody did, yes. And uh, you stated that she was bleeding also, or it appeared that she was bleeding, correct? I don't know if she was bleeding or not. Your Honor, if I may, I'd like to uh, pre present uh, ex Exhibits 3 and 4. All right. We'll have to take Exhibits 3 and 4 in defense to the witness. Thank you. Or then the is that the couch that you remember? Yeah, I believe that was on a far wall, like opposite wall from the chair. Approximately six to eight feet, as you stated, away from the chair. I'm gonna guess that, yes. And uh doesn't appear to be any blood on that couch, does there? I can't tell. There's a dark colored uh looks like a blanket there, so I don't know what's under the blanket, but Your Honor uh 
first I have a couple questions. Uh, in reference to her seated on that couch, you said you'd obviously been there for a while, right? You'd been on the scene for a while. You stayed there for quite some time. I was there for some time. So you were in and out, and you, after she was helped up off the floor to the couch, you probably observed her on the couch at times. It's some, yeah, at some point. And did she appear to be relaxed and seated back, or was she? I don't recall. Tense, that. straight. I don't recall. You don't recall. Um, do you recall what end of the couch she may have been sitting at from memory or even from your pictures? I really don't recall. Your Honor, uh, uh, may I exhibit, permit, place the uh, exhibits into evidence? Any objection? No, Your Honor. Do defendants exhibit exhibits number three and four are admitted without objection? And, uh, That would be the couch there, correct? Yes, that is the same one as the photos. Excuse it's me. the same one as the photos. And that one would also be? Yes, it is. And there's no coloration that you can determine there, correct? I apologize, this screen's a bit a bit different than normal. But you obviously I don't see, see anything right there, no. To clarify that, uh, you were there long enough that she left for the hospital and you were still around the scene, obviously walking through or doing what y'all had to to secure the scene. After she raised up off that couch, did you see any discoloration or blood or anything? I don't recall. But if it was red, you would have probably noticed it, right? I might have. Thank you. I'd like to speak on the home overall. You, you observed the home so you could tell that there was obviously an abundance of items there, correct? It was a large house. And uh, some, maybe even a lot being breakables, true? I don't recall. Uh, were there a lot of glass, figurines, ceramic potentially? Uh, I don't recall. Based on your observing of such scene, it did not appear to be dirty as you stated earlier, true? It did not appear to be dirty? There were sections that were, you know, not to the normal, but the overall yeah. house seemed to be pretty clean. The overall house seemed to be pretty clean. Um, what sections you would probably say the kitchen and the bedroom appear not to be normal? I would say the kitchen with the knife and the carpet cleaner lying on the ground did not appear normal. And in the uh, basement with some of the drawers open did not appear to be normal. The home appeared to be as if it was lived in. True. Correct. And you did state there were several on scene, including family. Um, taking into account you being first on scene, 
being there until approximately 9, 30 p.m. or even later, you were of knowledge of people being in seen in their interaction, true? You were of, you were of knowledge of their interaction with the scene? Of whose? Deputies, uh, the daughters. I mean, I don't know what everybody was doing at all times, if that's what you're asking. What was anybody doing? I can count for myself. I know there was other people on scene. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna read off a list of persons, and uh, you acknowledge if these were in fact there. Um, Heidi Young would be a daughter. You I may believe not so. Know her by name, but uh, she I, was there. I believe she was. And uh, Ilsa Terrell. I believe she another was. Another daughter. Low Meyer. Yes. Sergeant Lohmeyer was. Sergeant Lohmeyer. Uh, Sheriff Wagner, who was sheriff at that time. Correct. Chief Deputy Goodwin, or was it Smith? I'm not sure about them. Uh, yourself. Correct. Deputy Sergeant McMahon. Yes. Husband Schmidt. Who? Husband Tim Schmidt. Tim D. Schmidt, yes. Deputy Shoney. Yes. Kelsey Miller. Investigator Miller. Yeah, Investigator. she was there at one point. Yes, yes, I apologize. Uh, and uh, is it a possibility that Deputy Shackleton was there? I don't believe so. Thank you. Deputy Bowden, uh, you secured the scene, true? You, you secured the scene. I didn't, just myself. I know Sergeant Lohmeyer was there and then other people came later. I want to ask you once more, uh, you're, you're aware of the claims CL made, such as home invasion, hijacking, kidnapping, among others, correct? Correct. And sexually assaulted a number of times, throwing down stairs. Would I be correct in assuming throwing down stairs? Um, I didn't talk to her myself uh, very much. I know Sergeant Lohmeyer did, and that's why in my report I know I had to uh, refer to his. Um, <coughs> though you don't know, I would like to ask, did she appear? CL was a 77-year-old woman. Did she appear to be thrown downstairs? I don't know. Uh, Deputy, these are some very serious claims. They're extremely serious. Uh, you yourself, did you uh, urge CL to go to the hospital? Did I urge her? No, we, so we, when we get on scene, we're concerned obviously about her safety with the allegations. And also we're trying to look for, get information about a suspect. Cause obviously if there's suspects out, we're concerned about the safety of the public in general. I have just a few more questions, Deputy Bowden. Uh, in Adams County, what is the standard procedure in securing a crime scene such as this? Um, I know we get there and I, I generally do whatever my supervisor tells me to. Do you all tape the scene off? Do you all block the scene out from other intruders or persons entering? I know I do whatever my sergeant asked me to, um, whatever their protocol is. And that night, what did your sergeant ask you to do? Um, we were just there by ourselves initially, so we went inside and obviously spoke to her briefly um, and talked to Timothy Schmidt, the caller. And your sergeant was? Sergeant Joe Lohmeyer. Deputy, it, it interests me that approximately 10 people were in this scene, this very serious and heinous scene. Objection, Your Honor. Is there a question? I'm, I'm asking the question. Is that proper? I'm not sure. Like I said, I just I follow what my sergeant tells me to do. And uh, ISP, they... Brandy Field ISP, she arrived around 9 p.m. I'm not sure. You're not sure? 
Where was the proper procedure at in this matter? Objection, Your no. Honor. Argumentative. Sustain the objection. She's already testified. She's not aware of what that would be, Mr. Yon. That's all I have, Your Honor. Oh. All right. Any cross? No, Your Honor. Down. Thank you. I'd ask that she be released from her subpoena at this point, Your Honor. Mr. Your Honor, any reason why this witness uh, could not be released from her witness subpoena? No, sir. All right. Released from your subpoena and are free to go. Thank you. State have the next, I'm sorry, the defense have the next witness ready. Your Honor, I'd ask that uh, this one may take quite a while. We've still got quite a while left in the day, Mr. Yon. Do you yeah. have one ready? Could I use the restroom, please? Yeah. Approximately 2.30. It's we'll go, yeah, and we didn't get started until not too long ago. In fact, it was precisely at 1.37. So we'll take a 10-minute recess. The bailiff would accompany the jury to the jury assembly room. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. for approximately 10 minutes till 2.40.
Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. The next report is Nari Command Honorable Roger B. Thompson, Judge Presiding. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Young, are you prepared to call your next witness? Your Honor, uh, obviously you know I'm not, but uh, I guess I'm going to have to. Uh, Sheriff Wagner. 
right. And is Sheriff Wagner available? Sure the witness is available. Oh yeah, we, we do need a court reporter. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Nicole we forgot her. <laughs> I won't bring that up, Judge. All right. I think Trisha went to go. Sure Trisha went to go work at the facilities herself. Wait. Donnie, don't. Wait. We got a court order. Did you get this? No. Okay. Sorry. Not a problem. Please, please. You were starting a little early. It's my fault. All right, so we'll be back on the record in 21 CF 715, People versus Bradley on All parties and counsel previously mentioned are present. The jury is not present. And Mr. Yon, you were calling your next list witness, say Sheriff Wagner, correct? Yes, ex-Sheriff Wagner, Mr. Rich Wagner. All right, is ex-Sheriff Rich Wagner available? Not to my knowledge, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, uh... He had a subpoena to be here that was delivered to him. Okay. If I may, I have a bill approach with the subpoena. Yeah. Sure. Let me take a look. All right. Mr. Young has passed up a subpoena that is People of the State of Illinois versus Bradley S. Young, 21 CF 715. Reads, people of the state of Illinois to the sheriff of Adams County, greetings to Sheriff Rich Wagner, Adams County, Illinois. We command you, each of you personally, to be and appear before the said court in courtroom number blank at the courthouse in Quincy, forthwith, on the blank day of blank, A.D. 2000 blank, at the hour of blank, dot M., to testify and the truth to speak in relation to a certain matter in controversy now pending and undetermined in said circuit court between the people of the state of Illinois plaintiff and Bradley Scott Yon, defendant blank at the instance of, of said blank, laying aside all pretense and excuses whatsoever under penalty of what the law directs, issued by Lori R. Gershwander, Clerk of the Circuit Court of Adams County, this 10th day of July, 2023. It indicates that there was service on Rich Wagner on July 11th of 2023 by Tony Groughton, Sheriff, and by Caleb, I can't read the last name, but number 39, Deputy. So, Mr. Yon, how was Sheriff or retired Sheriff Rich Wagner to know what day and time he was to appear to testify pursuant to this subpoena, given there's no date and time on it? Obviously, he wouldn't, Your Honor. Uh, we'll move on to the next. All right. Although I really need it. Who would your next witness be? Could I have the uh, officer, investigator, deputy? He's the bailiff today. Summers has returned the subpoena to the defendant. Who's your next witness? Deputy Summers, Jared Summers. All right, is Deputy Jared Summers present? He is, Your Honor. All right, so let's recall the jurors. And we'll commence with the testimony of Mr. Summers.
Please jump in, Brian. This session of the court is now reconvened. Thank you. For the record, the jurors have returned to the jury box, and Mr. Yon was calling his next witness on behalf of the defense, Jared Summer. You can have Jared Summers. Deputy Circuit Clerk and raise your right hand. She'll swear you in. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes. I'm sitting over here to my right in the witness stand, please. <clears throat> Mr. Young, when you're ready with your questions. Uh, Mr. Summers, uh, can you state your name and badge number? Uh, Jared Summers, Sam 31. And uh, you're in an occupation with Adams County Sheriff's Department, right? Yes. And what do you do? Uh, I'm assigned to the West Central Illinois Drug Task Force and also the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. And uh, you were working on the night of uh, November... 9th of 2021, correct? Yes. And uh, can you relate to us a bit of the events that occurred that night? Uh, I got a call from Sergeant Mann. Um, he told me that we had an incident and uh, I arrived to the scene. And uh, what scene was that? Two down on uh, North Bottom Road to the scene that we're here for. And uh, can you explain briefly what that scene was in re reference to? Uh, Sergeant McMahon told me it was in reference to a home invasion and to uh, get there. So I was off duty at the time, so I responded as fast as I could. And uh, arriving there, uh, do you remember approximately what time you arrived? Uh, I believe it was a little after 7 p.m. And uh, upon arriving there, could you uh, go, go in depth on what you proceeded to do after arriving? Uh, Sergeant McMahon advised me that a whitish or silver Toyota was stolen from the residence, and he asked me to go look for surveillance cameras and to see if we saw where the Toyota went. And uh, you obviously talked to Sergeant McMahon <clears throat> There at the scene uh, outside your vehicle, correct? Yes. And uh, where was that at in reference to the scene? I, I don't remember in the driveway somewhere. And uh, was there any other officers there at that time? Yes. Could you recollect who? Uh, I remember Investigator Shoney, Investigator Miller, uh, Sergeant McMahon. Sergeant Lohmeyer and Deputy Bowden. And you state Deputy Miller was there? Uh, Investigator Miller, yes. Investigator Miller. Um, you didn't see any other persons, uh, citizens of the community? Uh, I was, there was, towards the garage, um, I saw some other people and don't know who they were. I wasn't up close to the house. Have you ever had any Happens or been around the husband, uh, Mr. Timothy Schmidt? No. You do not know him? No. And uh, have you ever met 
the victim or declarant in this case CL? No. And you did not see her that night either? No. So you didn't enter the scene? Uh, nope. I was just uh, basically at the driveway for five minutes, if that. And you then you proceeded to canvas the area for possible camera sightings of the defendant or the stolen vehicle, correct? Yes. Uh, could you relate to us after canvassing the local area what you did after that? Uh, didn't find any surveillance cameras. Uh, I believe I went back to the the scene very briefly. Uh, Sergeant Command advised me possible suspects of the defendant and Karen Blackledge. Uh, so I went back to the sheriff's office and started digging into them. You uh, after after starting to dig into possible suspects, as you state. Uh, can you further proceed into what you did after that? Um, looked in our database um, and figure out uh, basically ties of where they frequent, if they have ties from Quincy, just anywhere like that. And I came that they had ties in Springfield. And uh, further on, if you would. And that's all I did. And that concluded your night? At that point, no. Uh, anything else in reference to the case here at hand? Uh, later on, I, uh, when the investigators got back to the sheriff's office, uh, we wrote a probable cause report and then got a hold of Mr. Jones and advised him of the situation and then met him the next morning. You, didn't go in search of or were you were you given any other information during that time in reference to the suspects yes uh i did when i was doing the searching um on our database i realized that karen blackledge was a possible suspect in a vehicle theft earlier that day and you proceeded into Proceeded to do what after that? Uh, I got a hold of the Quincy Police Department officer that handled that. Um, he told me about it, and I uh, watched surveillance cameras of the incident. And uh, in the surveillance cameras, can you relay what you saw? And I saw a black female, which I knew to be Karen Blackledge. Um, she went up to, it was that instant replay. She went up to instant replay's front door and then walked to the truck, got in the truck, and drove away. And uh, Karen Blackledge was the only one you saw? Yes. Uh, how much of that camera footage did you review? I don't know. Enough to tell that it was only her prey? Yes. Um, and you were obviously giving this, giving this camera footage later on after checking the database for information. Uh, were you relayed approximately when that that vehicle, I believe it was a GMC, a blue, turquoise blue GMC, was stolen from Mr. Replay? Uh, it was in the morning, I believe, between 10 to noon. Uh, did you get a call in about suspects being sighted? Yes. And uh, where were they sighted? Uh, the Toyota was sighted at Hannibal gas station. Um, Hannibal Police Department tried to stop that vehicle, and that vehicle fled from them. Uh, and then later on, I don't remember what uh, road, but uh, Illinois State Police also observed the vehicle, and the vehicle fled from them also after conducting a, trying to conduct a traffic stop. And uh, upon trying to conduct a traffic stop in Illinois, do you remember approximately what time these occurrences were? No. Was it later in the night or? I was still working, so I, I don't know when it was. What time did you quit work that night? I do not know. Um, would it have been after 8 p.m.? Yes. 
So that's approximately two, two and a half, maybe even three hours after the occurrence. I guess I got on scene a little after seven, so that's what I remember. And uh, are you, do you have any knowledge as to when this alleged crime at 4300 Bottom Road happened? I, I'm not for sure. And uh, did you, were you ever able to, excuse me, I apologize. Uh, you did state that a uh, vehicle theft was from earlier today, true? From that day, yes. And, uh, Based on your review of that video, can you tell us what the description of that black female was, what she may have been wearing? I don't remember this, the description. Um, remember it was a black female. When I looked at the surveillance, I knew it was Karen Blackledge. Mm -hmm. You could in reference to the color maybe of the clothing or? I haven't seen the video in close to two years, so no, I don't know. And the, uh, how did she appear to be in that video? And you worked obviously in drug task force. Um, and you've known Karen for quite some time. How did she appear to be in that video? Um, I, I don't remember. I just remember her walking towards the door and then walking uh, back to the vehicle and leaving in it. Uh, you state that you didn't see the defendant myself in that video. Um, would it be possible that he wasn't even present? I don't know. And uh, Mr. Summers, uh, onto the Philip 66 video. Did you, were you able to see that? I don't remember if I looked at it or not. Have you since been given any other information on this alleged criminal act? What do you mean? Any details as to what happened? I understand you work in law enforcement. Is there a possibility you talk to others concerning this act and could shed some light on it? Like I'm going to object at this point, Your Honor. If, it would, if he's asking for what somebody else has told him about this act, that would be hearsay. Sustain, so you can rephrase the question. The sightings of defendants, I'm going to change the line of question completely. The sightings of defendants in uh, the car, the white uh, Toyota Avalon, uh, they were an hour later, you stated after 8 o'clock, correct? That, that would be my guess, yes. Uh, <coughs> do you know approximately how long it takes to get from Quincy, Illinois to Hannibal? I would say 30 minutes, 35 minutes. So if uh, this alleged crime happened at 528, which you're not sure, I've just given you knowledge of, and suspects departed around 6 p.m., that would leave enough time for one to change clothes, maybe take a shower, make it to Hannibal, Maybe make it to Hannibal. Objection leading. Sustained. Two hours would be enough to make it to Hannibal, correct? Yes. David Summers, I'd like to talk about the scene of the arrest. Uh, I'm going to object, Your Honor. The witness said he was never at the scene of the arrest. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. The scene of the arrest. I withdraw my objection. Your, uh, Deputy Summers, Investigator Summers, uh, as I stated, I'd like to talk about the scene of the arrest. Uh, you and other officers were notified that defendant, myself, and alleged co-defendant were arrested in Springfield, Illinois, correct? Correct. And uh, you traveled to Springfield, Illinois, true? Yes. 
Um, you also traveled with other officers. Yes. Uh, could you state who you traveled with? Uh, I rode with Sergeant McMahon and Investigator Shoney and Investigator Miller rode with each other. And uh, do you recall approximately what time you left for Springfield? Uh, shortly after the defendant was taken in custody is when we left. And this was the following day, correct? Yes. On the 10th of November? Yes. And uh, officers of the U.S. Marshal Service gathered info, which you're also part of, true? Yes. And they gathered info on the defendant and found that he and Blackledge were potentially at 906 East Cornell, true? Uh, I'm not sure of the exact address, but I believe so. And that was, do you, do you recall who provided that information? Uh, we knew the defendant was at Jamal's store the day prior. Uh, TFO Von Barron, who works with the U.S. Marshals, uh, spoke to the defendant's ex-girlfriend. Uh, she stated if he was in Springfield, he would be at Randy Young's residence, which is approximately 0.7 miles from Jamal's. So you're familiar with the area then? Yes. And uh, upon arriving to Springfield, what did you proceed to do? Uh, I went to the scene on uh, where the defendant was apprehended. And uh, upon arriving to that scene, obviously the defendant was already in custody at the local police station, correct? Correct. And uh, at that scene, what did you observe first, first entering the scene? Well, first entering was uh, an unrelated incident to this case that we believe, but I'm not for sure. Um, and then later, I spoke to a detective with Springfield Police Department, and she kind of showed me the area of where the defendant was apprehended. And could you, could you repeat that again about the unrelated incident stated? There was a vehicle there um, that there was a dead body in, uh, in the alley where the defendant was apprehended, and that's what it is. And there was approximately a property and a half over in a public alleyway, correct? Yeah. And uh, you stated that it's unrelated to the defendant myself? Uh, I'm not for sure, but I, I, that's for my understanding, yes. Uh, very big coincidence, true? Yeah. Um, one wouldn't expect to be looking for someone in these matters and come across a body in close proximity like that, would they? Well, what's the question? If, if you were looking for a suspect such as myself for these criminal acts, you wouldn't expect a coincidence such as that being that close to the scene of a rape. I mean, doing this job since 2012, I think anything's possible. Anything's possible, but it's a very big coincidence, Drew. Anything's possible, yes. Uh, you were showing around by, you were showing around the scene by uh, Springfield Police, correct? Yes. And uh, what did he show you outside of the coincidence? What did he show you in reference to the scene? Um, next to an RV, uh, he just kind of showed me around. I do remember on a chair that there was a purse um, that uh, the defendant was wearing during he was apprehended. And uh, can you speak on any procedure you took while there at that time, or did you just observe by eyesight? I just I observed. I, I was more of just uh, listening to Sergeant McMahon and what he wanted me to do at that time. And... Uh, in reference to that purse on the chair, were you able to, at that time, identify anything in that purse? At that time, no. In your report, you state that I would give you one moment. You state that Sergeant Henson showed us around the scene 
And while Sergeant Henson is showing us the scene, we observed in plain view a chair which was outside the purse Jan was wearing. Correct? Right? Yeah. And then you went and applied for a search warrant? Uh, Sergeant, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Investigator Shoney did. Um, you didn't identify or see anything on that chair other than the purse, Drew? Uh, I don't remember if it was at that time, um, but I do remember what was in the purse. I'm not sure if, we, if I remember. It was after we came back to the place, um, to the residence, or at that moment. But. And what was in the purse? In, that, in the purse, it, there was uh, U.S. currency, jewelry, a uh, voter's ID card with Christina Lohman's name on it, and a, I believe to the Toyota keys, and then also... Uh, Checks from ABS to uh, Christina Loman. And that concluded the items in the purse? Uh, I believe so, yes. Debbie, Debbie Summers, uh, I want to I want to jump over to processing a scene quickly. When you process a scene, you take pictures, correct? Yes. And how do you do that procedure? Do you place hands on items before you take the pictures or do you take the pictures first? So we take overall pictures of the whole scene, um, everything at, you know, the from top to bottom, we take a whole scene picture. Um, and then after those pictures are taken, then we start handling that evidence. And uh, you stated you saw the purse with voters registration cards, cash, jewelry, checks and it was very obviously in plain view just as this computer is here today correct i, I don't remember but it's seated right on the chair from my remembrance it was on the chair and then you proceeded to i believe the police station and officer shoney applied for a search warrant yes and then, after that, what did you all do? Uh, Sergeant McMahon, Investigator Shoney, and myself went back to uh, the scene and executed the search warrant. Deputy Shon or excuse me, Deputy Summers, are you aware of a hijacking, or what could be considered a hijacking? that I believe may have taken place on October 19th, 20th, sometime around there, outside no. of town? No. Uh, I'm having a hard time. I'd like to inquire as to when you went back to the scene and did the search. After the search warrant was signed from a Sangamon County judge, we went back to the scene. And you proceeded to search, and did you search the purse? I don't remember. Hearing your, hearing your report, it states verbatim, during the search warrant outside the RV's doors, we observed the purse that, Jan, that was on Jan. Inside the purse, there was a large amount of U.S. currency, numerous pieces of jewelry, Checks from ABS that had Tina Loman's name written on it. Keys to the stolen Toyota and Adams County voters registration card with Christine Loman's name on it. And then you go on. Also, in a suitcase, we found a radar detector and court documents with Jan's name on them. <coughs> uh, this is page seven of nine of your supplemental report, it is 0366 defense copy. Would you know who placed a pill bottle next to that purse, directly next to that purse? No. In that chair? No. But it wasn't there in the beginning, was it? I do not remember.
And would you relate to us what you did after this? And I would ask that you please go into detail, timing, actions taken, and the section. Judge objection, call for a narrative compound question. Would you relate to us? Objection. Would you relate to us what you did after that point? Objection, call for a narrative. What did you do? Objection for the same grounds. What did you do after? After we did executed the search warrant? After you initially started the search warrant. Objection still calls for a narrative, Your Honor. We need something more specific for this witness to answer the question. Can you go into detail the procedure of the search? Uh, we searched the outside uh, and inside the RV and took evidence. And uh, do you recall what evidence you took? Um, the items on the chair, uh, inside the RV, uh, I believe we found some more uh, U.S. currency, a gold watch, a purse, and I believe an ID, but I don't remember what ID that was. And uh, Deputy Summers, uh, which of you took the pictures? I know I didn't. I, I don't know who did. Um, do you recall a Burlington receipt? Like? A Burlington department store receipt? No. And uh, items recovered from Jan and Blackledge. That wouldn't be stuff you found at the scene, would it? That would be things you found on a person, right? The items. Items recovered from Jan and Blackledge? I mean, they, they were at the scene of where the defendant was apprehended. But they would be different than what's recovered on a person. I don't think I don't understand your question. Uh, items recovered from a defendant. If a defendant is found at a scene and then he is taken to a police station and you later come up to search the scene, the items found on the person at the police station would be different than the items found at the scene, correct? Well, the items at the scene would stay at the scene and the items on the... I mean, it, it, the items on a defendant would... I don't know what they did with them. They went to the police department. Um, and uh, do you uh, recall what kind of cell phone you have as far as your department cell phone? It's an iPhone. And it, do you remember the brand or I mean the model? Uh, at that time, it was. I have a new one now. I don't. I don't remember what brand we had then. Did you, did you observe a rosary on scene? Not that I remember. That's all I have, Your Honor. Uh, all right. Any cross? No, Your Honor. We'd ask that he be released from the people's subpoena. And do you to recall this witness, Mr. Young? Uh, potentially, Your Honor. We'd ask that you be released from our subpoena, at least, Your Honor. All right. We're releasing from the people's subpoena this time. Any further witness, Mr. Young? Your Honor, uh, I do. However, I'm not ready for them yet. Uh, I need to inquire with Sheriff Wagner and Massachusetts. Uh, also, I need to take up an issue of very high relevance 
concerning this case is uh, it would have to be outside the jury. It's uh, very important, Your Honor. It's in reference to evidence, items, and pictures. Well, Mr. Your Honor, if we're going to take it up outside the hearing of the jury, let's wait and we'll do so outside the hearing of the jury. They are still here. And so we will adjourn for the day. to admonish the jury as you have heard repeatedly before but i need to do it every time just to remind you we will now be in recess for the evening you may go about your normal affairs and and you must but you must not discuss this case with anyone including family members friends or your fellow fellow jurors as i told you at the beginning of this case your job as jurors is extremely important your decision on your verdict is to be based only upon the evidence that you see and hear in this courtroom and the instructions of law that i will give you therefore to remain fair and impartial you must refrain from doing the following things until you are discharged from service on this case you must not converse with anyone on any subject connected with this case you must not read or listen to anything outside of the court proceedings, including any outside comments or news accounts of this case. You must not discuss, them, discuss among yourselves any subject connected with the trial or form any opinion on the cause until you start your deliberation on your verdict. You must not view or go to the place where the offense was allegedly committed. If you hear or observe anything about this case outside this courtroom, whether inadvertently or otherwise, you must immediately inform me at the beginning of our next session. Do not discuss any of these things with your fellow jurors at any time. You are to report tomorrow in time to start again promptly at 9 a.m. to continue your jury service in this case. So I thank you for your patience and time today, and we'll see you back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Make sure you grab your big boards and your grapes, please. Thank you. You may be seated. John, you have an issue to raise? Your Honor, uh, last night I, I noticed some very disturbing things. And these are in reference to sexual assault pictures. Judge, uh, I believe there needs to be something done about these sexual assault pictures. The state's attorney stated that I've seen them several times. Your Honor, I've seen different pictures at least two different times. And the ones that were presented yesterday were not of Christine Loman. I don't care who testified of them. There were a couple that I am for sure without a doubt that were not Christine Loman. Which and pictures, Mr. Young? Let's identify them for the record. Your Honor, they are vaginal pictures. Do you have the people's exhibits numbers that we can reference for the record? So no, Your Honor. Your record. Judge, we can help with that. All right. If you can help out speed things along, please do so. Judge, the photos in question are, I believe, people's 31 and people's 32. Your Honor, there was... The first time I observed these, they were several more than this, and they were completely different than what we viewed yesterday. Um, I would suggest potentially the courts, with all attorneys involved, do an in-camera session or something to determine this, because I have pictures, not of the genital area from the sex assault exam, but I have pictures here that are completely different than what one has showed on this screen here. Um, 
There's no reason that they should be completely different, Your Honor. Uh, I think irrelevant some that needs to be addressed and something needs to be done about it. Your Honor, I also have other pictures, and though they may be disturbing, I have other pictures from a later time that also show that these aren't from the same person. Um, there's specific issues with that area that prove this. And uh, I'm not going to state them out loud because I don't want to offend anybody here today. But Mr. Jones, care to respond to the allegation? <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm dumbfounded. I'll, I'll say that. I'll start with that. One, Jacqueline Oglesby testified in open court that the photographs were photographs that she took, specifically people's 31 and 32 were photographs of the victim. Two, the defendant had every opportunity to cross-examine her on that, and he did not do that. They were admitted into evidence, and again, Jacqueline Oglesby, under oath, said they were of the victim in this case. Three, the defendant has seen those photos numerous times. We did not provide him copies of them because of the sensitive nature. We've addressed that with the court and with this defendant multiple times. He's asked to see them multiple times. And each time, Ms. Keck and I have gone down to the jail or gone over to the jail and shown him those photos and given him ample time to look at those photos. Are there more photos of her genitalia? Absolutely. We chose to use two because of the graphic nature of them. So he's right, there are more. We didn't use any more than the two that we used because of the graphic nature of them. That was our choice as trial strategy. That doesn't mean that they aren't of her, especially when the court has found the appropriate foundation has been laid and a witness testified as to that foundation. I don't know what the defendant's trying to do here now, Your Honor, but frankly, it's not the right time, it's not the right place, and I'll stop there. All right, so Mr. Yon, having heard the arguments of yourself and the state, the time to have objected to anything about people's exhibits, number 31 and number 32, was when the witness, Oglesby, was testifying, and she did testify to the foundation, identified those photographs of those, as the photograph she took of CL, of the injuries resulting from the sexual assault, as well as the photographs were identified by Dr. Kagumba as the photograph she had reviewed of the initial injuries and then basically that were healing of that sexual assault. And so, quite frankly, the water's run under the bridge already, Mr. Yon, and so there's nothing I can do about that. They're Your admitted Honor, uh, without your objection and will remain admitted without your objection. I have not been disclosed in photos, as you say. Uh, and again, Mr. Yon, the time to have objected even on that grounds passed when those witnesses were here to testify, and you did not object to those being admitted. It's too late. Because I did not know, Your Honor. I've not been given. You were in the courtroom, sir. I have not seen my, I've not seen. All right, I ruled. You were in the courtroom during the testimony yes, and with the exhibits. They're um, admitted. Yep. Any other issue, Mr. Yon? Uh, uh, interviewing witnesses, Your Honor. It's the same answer I had for you yesterday, sir. And uh, we spoke on that today and determined that we would proceed further into that. What were we proceeding further into? Well, I'd indicated, Your Honor, that this. This morning, I indicated that I was willing to go speak with Ms. Blockledge again and to inquire whether or not she would do that. Um, frankly, I'm not sure that I'm in the mood to do that, but I will still do that because I don't want this defendant to feel like he's being treated unfairly. All right. So Mr. Jones will likely be accompanied by Ms. Keck as well as a law enforcement officer to visit with Ms. Blackledge to see if she's changed her mind from last evening and wishes to speak with you or not. They'll facilitate that if she does so desire. We will, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, people can say anything, and people can be believed, as long as there's a foundation, true. And Mr. Jones and Ms. Keck, 
are officers of this court, sir, and so they have a ethical obligation as officers of the court to be truthful with this court. And we had testimony this morning to back up the representations that were made. Yes, sir. That's about the best I can do, sir. I'm not going to go ask her because I'm not a witness in this case. Yes. I've got to be the judge. Yes, okay? Sir. Anything else, Mr. Yon? No, Your Honor. Anything for the people? Yes, Your Honor. Um, as far as tomorrow, if the defendant is going to call witnesses, we would like to know who they are so that we can help facilitate them being in court so we don't deal with the same issue that we've dealt with today. I would also point out that two of the witnesses that the defendant indicated he was he were, was likely to call, um, and one that he wanted to recall, were Brian Curran and Kelsey Miller. Both those individuals are under our subpoena. They are not under a subpoena from the defendant. I want to be clear on that. They are only available tomorrow if the defendant wants to call them. Once tomorrow runs, they are not available next week. And again, they are only under the people's subpoena. And that was Kelsey Miller, correct? Kelsey Miller and Brian Curran. Uh, I don't want to call Brian Curran. He has no so issues. If we can confirm that we can release Brian Curran from his subpoena, I'll do that. And then that just leaves Kelsey Miller. Yeah, Your Honor, uh, we can release Brian Curran. Brian Curran has nothing to do with this case. All right, so Brian Curran can be released from the state subpoena to be a witness in this case. And as far as Kelsey Miller, Mr. Yon, are you going to want her available to testify? Tomorrow afternoon, Judge. We will have her here and available. The state will make an effort to make her here and available tomorrow. We will do that, Your Honor. Then, finally, Your Honor, uh, Heidi Young and Ilsa Terrell um, and Tim Schmidt, because uh, the defendant also indicated he may want to recall those people. So if he wants them here, if he wants to give me a time, I will make sure that those individuals are available. Mr. Young, do you wish to call Heidi Young as a witness? Yes, uh, that should be brief. Uh, it's just yes or no, but what time? You want the first thing in the morning or afternoon? Early afternoon. And then Ilsa or Ilsa Terrell, do you want to call her as a witness? Uh, before, or excuse me, we could move Heidi up a bit, or either or, you know, vice versa. But I prefer to do Kelsey Miller last. All right, Tim, Timothy Schmidt, are you wishing to call him as a witness? Uh, potentially in the morning, guys. I will have Mr. Schmidt here in the morning. I will have Kelsey Miller here at uh, 12 30, 1 o'clock. Um, does he want to give me a time for Heidi Young and Ilsa Terrell? I would suggest Ms. Young and Terrell also be here in the morning. I'm not going to be taking these breaks waiting for witnesses to be available. I want them lined up and ready to go. Yes, sir. Next witness, what next witness. And so. if there are any other witnesses he wants tomorrow. Mr. Yon, are you wanting the state's assistance in gathering or trying uh, to get other witnesses here? I would think that uh, them may take up most of the day. Well, we're going to fill the day, sir, so any other witness? Uh, Jake McMahon. We will have Officer or Sergeant McMahon here in the morning as well. Any other witness, Mr. Young? No, for the moment, Your Honor, no. I believe them should. All right, and again, I expect to fill the day, so if we come up on 1.30 again with no witnesses, I mean, you're going to either fill the time or we're going to be adjourned and taking up instructions to the jury, so... Make sure uh, we've got we, enough people to fill the day, sir. I guess we can throw Dr. Finster. He's, he's Dr. Finster has not been properly served with the subpoena, Your no, Honor. He's our subpoena, but he's not available this week. He's not available this week. Only the subpoena right. well. Kevin Douglas. Does he have a subpoena? 
I'm not sure if Kevin Douglas has been subpoenaed by the defense. been issued a subpoena, Mr. Young? Uh, no, not on my behalf, no. I didn't think I'd have to since he's already been added to the list. Of I, Again, I, can, I can try to have him here, I, but he's not under subpoena, so there's not much I can do, but I will, but I will attempt to have Officer Douglas here. Beneficial. Anyone else, Mr. Young? Idea on the judge. All right. Anything else for the people? No, Your Honor. We will be adjourned. It is now 3 30 in the afternoon. See you all back here shortly before 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. This is a report now saying we're going to Yeah, those photos. Those photos.